Perfect. Hi, can everyone hear us okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then if possible, can I see faces just maybe the first five minutes? Was everyone able to get to this session through Collaborate through Blackboard, or did you use the link? Um, I used the link for mine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. The, the updated link that I just sent? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did anyone go through Blackboard? Negative? Okay. I'll just make sure and put that link up there every single week. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on Cengage? Did Eric and Jordan clear those up for you yesterday? Good? Okay. Do you want to add anything before we start? Um, so I'm on to Mona. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everybody here um, for your, I guess, your second summer session. I know Eric and Jordan were there yesterday. Um, and I, I do require, um, when I'm teaching via Zoom or Collaborate, that you guys do keep your videos on the whole time so we can see you, that you're engaged. Um, we don't want to have somebody, you know, turning it on and then doing their housework or playing with their cat or something like that. Uh, the information that we're going to be giving you this summer is extremely important. It's the foundation of everything that we will be going over the next two semesters after this. And so we, you know, even though it's online and it's a little more casual where your tests, um, you're given a little bit more time on Fridays to take your tests, it's still extremely important if you don't do well in the summer, um, you're not going to do well the next two semesters. So we we just want you here. We want you engaged, um, and it's it's only you know a couple hours each week that we require that of you outside of the other work that you're going to be having. So um, treat this as if it were an in-class session. So anyway, I think Angel's going to go over her syllabus. Um, it doesn't sound like anybody has any questions about MindTap. I know Jordan and Eric were able to get most people on, except for one person. Um, but if you don't have any questions, then Angel will go through her syllabus and um, the schedule for her class. Hey, Madeline, go ahead. You might be on mute, Madeline. We can't hear you. Sorry, Madeline. We still can't hear you. Do they have a chat um, area in here? Can they type in a question to collaborate? I'll have to check and see. Yeah, hey, yeah they can use the chat. Okay. First little bubble there. Oh, there we go. There it is. Okay. So yeah, if your audio isn't working and you have a question, you can put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. And they also have, yeah, a, have the uh, raise your hand feature that Angel is calling yeah. on Madeline for. <laughs> so Madeline, if you find that chat feature off to your right, lower corner. Maybe you can ask the question there if you can't get the sound to work. All 
class. Do you want the 12 right there? The yeah. attendance? Yeah. 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 Very, very professional. All right. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and get started with the syllabus. And I hope everyone is able to pull this up. I'd recommend you print it um, just so that you can kind of keep track of everything. No, you're right, Mona, I do. Ask if they can see it or Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> All right, can everyone see the syllabus? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right, so students and instructors are accountable for all information on this syllabus, as well as the institutional syllabus, which is located in this course's Blackboard site. For more information regarding library resources, accommodations, and more, please refer to the college institution, institutional syllabus. Uh, so this is the Department of Health Professions Intro and Basic Sciences Surge 100 class. My email is in the top left hand corner. Please feel free to email me with any questions, concerns, uh, we do cover a lot of information in this class, and where it's only an eight-week class, I do not want you to get behind. So if you have any issues, concerns, if you, you know, someone unexpectedly passes away in your family, et cetera, please give me a heads up as soon as possible. My phone number is also there. Uh, if you can use text messaging from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m., um, I I do have little kids and I'm sure you can all relate, but I'm more than happy to respond by text messaging if it's urgent. If you are dealing with test issues on, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and for some reason you can't get into Blackboard, et cetera, you know, your computer's down, the internet's down, whatever the issue is, please do not hesitate to text me on those days. I know that anxiety from not being able to get into a test and complete a test on a deadline. So don't hesitate. <clears throat> And don't cause yourself to have anxiety or stress. So the course description of Surge 100, Introduction and Basic Sciences, three credits. It's a summer course, the study of the perioperative healthcare team and its language, the evolution and basic principles of asepsis, ethical, moral, and legal responsibilities, and the physical characteristics of the operating room suite. The co-rec, of course, is with Jordan, um, or Professor Kies, Surge 103, and your prereqs, all of you were accepted. Congratulations into the CWI Surgical Technology Program. Lecture hours are Wednesday from nine to noon, and it is an online lecture. Like Mona just said, if you can make every effort to be here, you will do well in the program. I can answer questions, we can address issues, any confusion, et cetera. So please, please, please try to make the live lectures. We They will be recorded and we will post them on Blackboard. However, please make every effort uh, to make the live lectures. I am going to try to do a study slash question session Thursday nights from seven to nine. That's not on the syllabus, but where this is an online course with a lot of important information, I wanna make sure that you all fully understand it. So I will add that in from seven to nine on Thursday and you guys can pop in and out with questions about the material from the from the previous week module. So this statement says you're not allowed into the faculty office or the quail building unless you're escorted by an instructor. Truly this summer, I I think Professor Key is maybe doing an in-lab session somewhere along the line. Um, my only in-person session will be at the hospital next Monday at St. Alphonsus, and I will be sending out a map for parking and entrance instructions. But just know that you aren't allowed in the lab building unless you have an instructor with you. 
The focus of this course is to introduce the surgical technology student to the historical perspective of surgery and the profession as it relates to other members of the surgical team. I'm not gonna read all the course objectives and outcomes as I think it's eight pages worth, but just realize that there is a lot of information that we are gonna teach you in the next eight weeks. Um, and so just, just be prepared for a lot of reading and, and a lot of studying. I'm gonna jump to page eight of this syllabus. And actually on my screen, it's a little bit farther. Right, so assessments for this course, there will be seven exams worth 100 points each. And we'll go over the schedule for those exams. Exams open on Friday morning, and then they will close Sunday night at midnight. There will be a PowerPoint presentation worth 50 points, and that will be later on in the course. It is not yet in the module on Blackboard, but it will be within a couple weeks. There will be a discussion board when we do the ethical and legal section. And then the final exam will be worth 200 points. Total points are 1,050. You get 966 to 1050 points. You get 92 to 100%. 882 to 965 is 84 to 91.9. 787 to 881 is 75 to 83.9. And then if you receive 786, 786 points or below, um, that is subject to dismissal from the surgical technology program. All of this information that we teach you this summer is vital for you to be successful in the hospital and in the operating rooms. So I want you to know it, it's not information that you can cram before the test because it's all information that you're gonna use throughout this, this fall semester and spring semester in your clinicals and will be on your national exam after you complete the program. So just make an effort to actually learn the material instead of doing a quick memorization before the exam. I am going to give 25 points of extra credit uh, if you complete chapters one through five in MindTap, and that's completing the multiple choice, true false, and the certification style exam quizzes with a 90% and above. And you can take those quizzes as many times as you want. If you want the extra credit, it has to be done by July 30th uh, before the final exam. So textbooks, I hope everyone was able to get their textbooks. And the ebook you can log on to on Cengage and see. Um, so you should have the surgical technology for the surgical technologist, the fifth edition. You should also have two big module books with that book as well. And your, your CWI approved scrubs, that I think those will come later this fall. Actually, no, they will. Um they know which ones they're supposed to purchase at this time. Okay. And after the 15th of June, they can go to Career Uniforms and have those embroidered, or Career Perfect. Uniforms can order those for them. They they have a list of okay. what's accepted. Perfect. So we will cover the course calendar after the syllabus, course expectations, see the policy and procedural manual on the CWI website. I'm just going to kind of skim through this stuff because we do have a lot to cover today. Behavioral expectations, just make sure that you're courteous and respectful to all of your co-students in the class. Sorry, that skipped across. Um, you know, texting sometimes is hard to read emotion-wise, so have the best intentions of your instructors and your students. Everyone's here. We all want you to be successful. We don't want you to fail this program. So we're gonna make every single effort to help you, and we want you to make every single effort to be successful in this program. Academic honesty, all work submitted by a student must represent his or own original ideas, or else be correctly cited and referenced to avoid plagiarism. Cheating or plagiarism in any form is unacceptable. Violations may result in disciplinary action, ranging from failure of the assignment to failure of the entire course. Emergency procedures, this is if you're in the lab. So you just want to exit the main door. 
And then learn to learn. Students learn that as important as content knowledge is, shaping one future requires the development of skill in discerning, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating knowledge in diverse contexts. The educational experience at CWI prepares students for a world in which they are likely to change occupations and face unpredictable life events. We strive to develop courses and learning experiences that give students the tools to be confident and thrive in a complex, information-saturated, diverse, and dynamic world. Does anybody have any questions? I do have a question about the exams. Hit it. Um, so are the exams going to be time? How many questions? And are we going to be able to have like open book and open notes? Okay, so awesome question. So exams open Friday morning at 12.01 and go through Sunday night at midnight. My exams are 50 questions and they're worth two points each. They are not open book. They are not open notes. For those 50 questions, you're going to have 45 minutes. So that's about 45 seconds for each question. And I'll tell you, we do that on purpose because we don't want you looking through your notes or looking through your book. When you take your national exam, you will not be able to take a book or have notes with you. It, it is everything that you will have learned in this program. So it's important that you really learn this material. Don't try to memorize it, you know, just for the test. Really, really learn it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And, um, and did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, I have one more okay. question as well. Um, so Absolutely. I know this class is through online and everything, but are you going to be posting the class after we're done with this in Blackboard? Yes. So we can review yes. whatever we went through it? Absolutely. Every single session will be recorded. If for some reason there are technical issues and it doesn't record or the power goes out, whatever it is, I will make another lecture video with all the material that we covered. Okay. But I plan on, on recording every single session. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. So I, I, this is Mona again. I just wanted to say one other thing. Um, Angel mentioned the policy and procedure manual. And just so you know, that will be presented to you guys right before the fall semester. And we will have a mandatory orientation the Thursday prior to when classes start. It'll, we haven't decided on the exact time, but most likely it will be about four in the afternoon. And we'll probably take a few hours um, because everything we're doing this semester is online and this is new to us as well there's things that we decided not to do until the fall but we don't want to take up valuable class time in the fall for some of this so it'll be a mandatory in class orientation so you'll be in the surgical technology lab so just keep that in mind i don't have the date in front of me but it's the thursday before classes start on um, i believe classes start on august 23rd so that thursday before um, probably four in the afternoon where I'm just trying to coordinate with the other instructors right now, but just so everyone knows to keep those dates in mind uh, for now. Did, did everybody hear Mona? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just important, important dates. Make sure you write them down, have child care, et cetera. All right. Can everyone see the surgery or, I'm sorry, the summer 2021 lecture and, and exam schedule. Yeah. Okay. So yes. week one, this, thank you, Jordan. Week one, June 7th through 11th, we're going to cover the intro and history to surgery and surgical technology. So I want you to read chapter one if you have not already. Um, and then you're assigned modules. Was everybody able to pull up the module 1A? Yeah, I was. Okay, perfect. So if you're able to pull that up, print it off, and then go through it as you're reading through the material. I can promise you as an instructor, I am pulling questions from that module. So even though you don't have to turn it in, I would still do the module because it's going to give you a head start on your exam. Okay? So your exam opens on Friday, June 11th. 
and then it will close on Sunday at midnight. Week two, we're gonna do hospital and OR environment. So next week, I will not be having a lecture on Wednesday morning. I will be giving my lecture Monday night at the hospital. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna meet at the St. Alphonsus Hospital in Boise on Curtis Road. We'll meet in the front lobby and then we're gonna go upstairs, change into scrubs and actually dress down just as if we were gonna go scrub a case. I'm gonna take you a tour through the hospital. St. Alphonsus that we're going to is the only trauma hospital in the Boise area. Um, so we're gonna kind of go later at night because I wanted less, less traffic in the OR. We're gonna go through one of the operating rooms. Uh, you'll be able to see Da Vinci, which is a, a robot that is kind of the new minimally invasive way that surgery is being performed. And it's at all the hospitals. So St. Luke's downtown, St. Luke's Meridian, St. Al's all have the Da Vinci robots. Uh, we'll cover a lot of the material in chapter five. I think Jordan is also going to try to do most of his lecture that evening as well. So I would plan on anywhere from two to three hours because we want you guys, we want to give you a good experience and, and have some hands on activity uh, for the material that's covered in chapter five. There's also modules next week, surgical environment and basic operating room equipment. And then your exam opens up June 18th. So for week three, we're going to do the surgical patient. And I want you to watch a film. It's, uh, it's called Being Mortal. And it's, it's an amazing film. Um, you know, I think anybody who deals with death or is in the healthcare profession uh, should watch this film. It's a big eye opener. For modules, there aren't any assigned modules, but I do have an assignment that I'm gonna be posting next week for this, for week three. Then your exam opens Friday, June 25th, and then closes Sunday at midnight. Week four, June 28th through July 2nd, special populations, and that's all about patients that don't fit your so-called norm. Uh, chapter four in the AST text, and then your assigned module care of the patients with special or complex needs. And then there's also an ARN video, caring for the older adult in surgery. Just so everyone's aware, all the ARN videos are in Surge 103. So make sure that you find them ahead of time. Don't wait until the last minute. And again, as an instructor, I am telling you, test questions are pulled from these videos. So don't think that it's just a mindless assignment. I promise there are questions from these videos on your weekly exams. <laughs> Week five, perioperative duties of surgical team. And I'm also gonna be showing uh, AST video that week during lecture. Assign modules, so there's quite a few modules for this. Perioperative duties, AORN video helping patients, Another ARN video, patient's perspective. Another ARN video, perioperative environment, okay? So again, test questions will be coming from those modules and the videos. Exam opens on Friday, July 9th, and closes Sunday at midnight. Week six, communication and teamwork assigned modules, interpersonal relationships, and then an ARN video, effective communication. Your exam will open July 16th and close the following Sunday. Week seven, legal and ethics. Assigned modules, legal and ethical, and then the ARN video, risk management. Exam opens Friday, closes on Sunday. Week eight is your final. I'm gonna have it open on Friday and then close on Sunday just so that we follow the same consistent pattern as the previous seven weeks. I'll try to send out an email or maybe an announcement the week prior. If you want to have a study session with me and we can go over questions, um, you know, answer any concerns that you may have, I am more than happy to do that. Again, we wanna see you guys succeed. We wanna see you do well. So I'm more than happy to put together a review session I know that Professor Kia has felt the same way. So if you wanna come into the lab that week, you know, we can do a Jeopardy, we can do however, you know, whatever way will help you guys study, we're more than happy to oblige 
and make sure that you feel prepared for your finals. All right, is there anything else you want to add, Mona? Um, no. So, okay. Um, did you talk to them about the folders within Blackboard where you have the APS stuff? Yeah, so if you look in Blackboard, can everyone see my screen of what I'm doing? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so weekly yeah. modules, there's my, there's, okay, perfect. There's my week one, and I, and I know it's summertime, and again, we're hitting with you, we're hitting you with a lot of information. I try to just make it super simple, okay? So just check this stuff off as you go through each week. Read chapter one, print off the written test PDF document, complete the document, um, complete the Send Gauge Learning chapter one, watch the Mayo Clinic Faith video, and then take the exam. So here is your module. Print it off and go through it as you, as you read through your material. Okay, does anybody have any questions? I do have a question about discussion board. So you I bet. On the sketch, it doesn't say anything. When are they due? When do they open? C correct. So you will have one discussion board and it will be during the week of the legal and ethical. And so it will open up that Monday and then be due by Sunday. Okay. So as, yeah, so as we move through each weekly module, I may be changing uh, or adding things to it. So I'm definitely gonna add on the discussion board. We had to wait and see how many students were finalized um, before I divided you up into groups. So with the discussion board, I'll divide you up into groups and then you'll address a legal and ethical uh, situation okay are you gonna Does that let make us sense? know on which week it will be that yep it'll be the legal and ethical week on the okay so it is i think that's week seven yes legal and ethical responsibilities so you have six weeks and i promise i'll get that up in the next couple weeks um but what it'll be is you'll make a post and then I want you to comment on a couple of your <clears throat> co-students posts that are also in that same group. And then for your PowerPoint presentation, it'll be during week six and it'll, it'll be very short, very simple. It'll be a 10 to 12 uh, page PowerPoint presentation, slide, excuse me, just kind of about yourself. You know, what kind of surgery do you think you're gonna like? What, what's your goal at the end of the program? Um, and it's just something I, I kind of want you guys to think about um, and maybe process. But again, it's not going to be a huge assignment, pretty basic, and I'll get the rubric up there of how I'm going to grade it. All right, any other questions? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and show this video. <clears throat> it's a history on surgery, <clears throat> and it does cover some of the material in your book. But again, I would highly encourage you, please read chapter one uh, of your book and do the modules. <clears throat> Can everybody hear the video? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. You should be able to just, yeah, enlarge right over here, full screen. Sorry, I was going to introduce this. Thank you. 
Today, major surgery is routine and safe, but it hasn't always been that way. Many commonplace surgical procedures were quite lethal. Patients battled the odds to survive the surgeon's blade. There was a feeling that the pain of surgery was a good thing. The history of surgery is one of faith and oblivion. The macabre and the miraculous. It's a small cost to pay to give someone's life back. But ultimately, it is a story of human courage. Sixty-five-year-old Gary Scholes is about to undergo a serious operation. I'm here for a uh, bypass surgery. Has it been uh, suggested by my doctor? And uh, let's take place tomorrow morning. But if this or any operation is to be a success, there are three main barriers that must be overcome. First, the patient must be protected from pain. Once their insides are exposed, infection is a major threat. And finally, shock caused by blood loss must be kept at a minimum. If any of these three problems are not dealt with properly, Gary's life will be in grave danger. I'm not bracing the whole side not something you can back away from, but they always seem to think that this particular operation will put 10 years on, on the uh, lifespan. Gary needs the surgery because his heart can't properly supply itself with blood. Sections of his coronary arteries are blocked with fatty deposits and must be bypassed. His entire blood supply will be rerouted through a heart-lung machine and his heart stopped. A section of vein is harvested from his leg to use as a material for the bypass grafts. The grafts are sewn across the damaged areas of coronary artery like jumper cables, hopefully restoring a healthy blood supply to Gary's heart tissue. Okay, so it's going to be thin on your face. It's going to for me, but it won't be uncomfortable. Right? So I'm just going to hold this up for this one. Okay. Of course, Gary's first worry is that he feels no pain. Luckily for him, anesthesia is now a precise and highly effective science. He is put gently to sleep, and with an ultrasound probe as a guide, a central line is inserted into his jugular vein. This will provide him with a continuous cocktail of painkillers, antibiotics, and other drugs to stabilize his body. But there was a time when patients had no such protection from pain, and evidence of it lies in this London church. In 1956, a historian exploring the attic discovered an that had been abandoned and forgotten for a hundred years. An operating room like this with no antiseptic procedure no anesthetics, no possibility of uh, blood transfusion. It was a grim ordeal for the patient. Back then, surgery was far more likely to kill than cure. The unlucky patient would be held down by several large medical students while they waited for the surgeon to begin. If they were lucky, they might have been given some brandy or opiates, but otherwise there was nothing to shield them from the pain of the knife, and their agony was public. The rooms were called operating theaters because of the audience. Several hundred spectators would witness every scream and cut. The faster the operation takes place, the less chance there is of the patient going into shock or trauma. And this was commonly known as speed surgery. In the 19th century, with the famous surgeon Robert Liston, uh, it was actually known as operating by the watch. As students keenly time them, surgeons race to remove limbs at record speed. Liston is reported to have amputated a leg in 26 seconds, although at the cost of three of his assistant's fingers and one of the patient's testicles.
clearly, if surgery was to progress beyond frenzied butchery, doctors must find a way of reliably controlling pain. When hypnosis became fashionable in the early 19th century, one of its first uses was as an anesthetic. Although successful in some cases, it was very unpredictable. And rather than risk patients snapping out of their trances mid amputation the method was swiftly abandoned. Chemistry seemed more promising. A newly discovered gas, nitrous oxide, was proposed by Humphrey Davy in 1800 as an effective painkiller. However, his work was published in an obscure journal and seen by virtually nobody. Still, its euphoric side effects meant nitrous oxide caught on as a recreational drug, and it soon gained its more familiar name, laughing gas. It would take almost half a century before anyone would adapt it to surgery. In 1844, a dentist called Horace Wells gave nitrous oxide to a schoolboy before extracting a tooth. Unfortunately, he didn't give him quite enough. And in front of a large influential crowd, the boy screamed, hit Wells, and ran out. Wells was rose. And several years later, he committed suicide in an insane asylum. Ironically, by taking laughing gas and slashing his thigh open with a scalpel. However, another recreational drug, ether, was becoming well known for its numbing effects. Two years after Wells' failure, William Morton arranged another pain-killing demonstration. On October 16, 1846, he successfully sedated a patient with ether, and the surgeon painlessly removed a tumor from his neck. The surgeon, John Collins Warren, uttered the immortal words, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. The age of modern anesthesia had arrived, and most surgeons celebrated. Some, however, didn't. There was a feeling that the pain of surgery was a good thing. Obviously, that depended on which end of the knife you were on, and public demand soon meant ether became widely used. Although effective, it was unstable and extremely unpleasant to breathe, and the search was on for an alternative. In Edinburgh, a fashionable doctor called James Young Simpson was famous for his dinner parties, where guests would try various intoxicating chemicals after tea. One evening, Simpson and company found themselves under the table rather faster than usual. When he regained feeling in his legs, Simpson realized he had made an important discovery. The compound they had taken proved to be just as effective as ether at numbing pain, while being less irritating and easier to handle. It was called chloroform. Simpson's first public demonstration was at a birth in 1847. The mother, grateful after a pain-free delivery, christened her unfortunate daughter anesthesia. For a while, it seemed chloroform would completely replace ether, but within the first year of its use, several patients mysteriously died while under its influence. In the wake of the scandal, most surgeons returned to ether and began to invent ways to make it easier to breathe. It was eventually combined with another comeback chemical, nitrous oxide, to form the basis of anesthesia for the next century. At last, surgeons had a reliable method of controlling pain, and a whole new world opened up to them. Anesthesia provided a patient who was not in pain, not moving, and who was protected to an extent from the shock of the operation. But patients weren't protected from the biggest killer of all, infection of their wounds. Now that they had mastered pain, surgeons ventured into the body deeper than ever before. However, the biggest killer of their patients was still lying in wait for them, bacteria. Our skin is our first and most effective line of defense against the agents of infection. But when it is cut through by the surgeon's blade, bacteria gain access to the vulnerable inside of the body. They feed 
multiply and poison us with their secretions unless we take steps to stop them. We like to keep the things that we own as clean as we can. That's why Dan is cleaning his bike. It looks much better now. But his hands don't. Now they need cleaning. Dan washes up because for one thing, dirty hands don't look very good. Clean hands look much better. But these are different hands, a doctor's hands. And they're being washed for a more important reason than a parent's. Before any surgery begins in a modern operating theater, extreme care is taken to make sure everything that will come into contact with the patient is clean. Surgeons wash their hands obsessively and sheathe themselves head to toe in protective layers. Instruments are scrubbed, boiled, and subjected to harsh vacuum at extreme temperature. And elaborate rituals are performed to avoid the faintest possibility of contagion. As a result, a modern operating theater is a sea of sterile green and blue. But they weren't always like that. At the time of this operating theater in the early 19th century, the medical profession and the surgeons had no real concept of how infection spread. And this had a great significance both for the patients and the surgeons. Many uh, quite commonplace surgical procedures were quite lethal because of the possibility of wound infection. One in three patients died from so-called hospital fever, which was simply infection from the hordes of bacteria coating every surface in the room. The rough wood of the operating table hid germs in every nook and cranny, while beneath the wound only a box of sawdust caught the blood. Even the surgical instruments were lethal. Although stylish, their velvet cases and wooden handles soaked up blood and fluids and provided fertile breeding grounds for disease. Surgeons could wash their hands in a bowl of well water, but most only did so on the way out of an operation before hitting the town. And they weren't exactly dressed for success. Most surgeons would religiously wear their favorite operating gown, no matter how encrusted with blood and pus it had become. Popular legend had it that they had no real need for coat hooks in theaters. The filthy gowns could stand up by themselves. Many uh, what we would think of as quite regular operations today were simply off limits. Most significantly, what was not practiced was invasive surgery. In other, in other words, any surgery that was going into the body sac itself into, to treat uh, the organs. You should think of a room like this as really being like a modern accident and emergency room. Quite basic operations were carried out. The work a day stuff with a surgeon would be the sort of uh, repair of uh, fractures, of compound fractures. Uh, if infection, in this case it would be gangrene, had set into the limbs, then the race against gangrene spreading through the body would be amputation. <laughs> The horrors of gangrene and amputation were never more apparent than during the Civil War. In October 1862, a particularly bloody battle was fought near Perryville, Kentucky. Each year, thousands reenacted on the same ground. Also recreated is the carnage that took place at the overcrowded field hospitals. Surgery during the Civil War was very archaic compared to our standards, but it was the best medicine they had during the time period. Although by that time both ether and chloroform were available as pain relief, there was no way to control infection, and gangrene ran rapidly. The Civil War was the first major conflict in history where the majority of wounds were caused by gunshots. The muskets at the time fired rough lumps of lead at low muzzle velocities, resulting in horrific flesh wounds. Due to the inevitable infection, any wound to the body was probably fatal and any injured limb could be treated only one way. <laughs> Amputated limbs were just thrown in piles, further adding to the risk of infection. 
So they did learn a little about sterilization, but they didn't really realize that two Confederate surgeons down south when they ran out suture material would take horse hair to use the suture material. But to get horse hair to use the suture material, they would have to boil it to get it soft enough. And what they were doing was actually sterilizing the wound. During the Civil War, you have to remember surgeons wanted pus. Pus was a sign of healing. Today we know as pus as infection. But they wanted pus. So when they took this horse hair and after boiling it and saw up a soldier with it, come back two or three days later, there was no pus. And the doctors actually thought they did something wrong. One time. Okay. Pasteur didn't come out with his third germs in Europe until 1867, and we laughed at that for almost 10 years here in the United States. So he was crazy. Louis Pasteur was a French chemist who forever changed how we think about disease and infection. His radical theory that we are surrounded by invisible creatures that cause rotting, fermentation, and disease seemed so bizarre at the time that few people believed him. One man who did, however, was a young surgeon called Joseph Lister, who was struggling to control infection in his Glasgow hospital. The hospitals were filthy. I still say it's a street outside. But no one seems to have connected uh, the filth uh, in the hospitals with the serious death rate from infections after surgery inside. Uh, they seem to be quite used to this as just a natural outcome surgery. In 1864, Pasteur had single-handedly saved Francis wine crop, which was spoiling in the barrels. He demonstrated that the disease-causing agents could be killed by heat, a process later adapted to milk and beer and named pasteurization in his honor. Obviously, infected patients couldn't be heated over large coal fires, so Lister turned to a newly discovered chemical called carbolic acid. Carbolic acid is more successful in the um, sewage works. It purified, sweetened the air, i.e. removed the microorganisms, and Lister immediately applied the carbolic acid in dressings. The first guinea pig for the new treatment was a young boy with a compound fracture of the leg. As in the Civil War, this was a life-threatening injury if infection set in, and normal procedure was to amputate immediately. However, Lister's carbolic soap bandages kept the wound clean while the bone healed, and the boy's leg was safe. After this success, Lister experimented with more sophisticated methods of applying his germ killer. He developed his famous sprayer, which kept a fine mist of carbolic over both patient and doctor. He had finally found a weapon against the surgeon's worst enemy. He moved from Glasgow to Edinburgh and then to London, taking with him the method which was getting increasingly uh, uh, more sophisticated in application and was increasingly adopted by everyone to the, the position that we are now in, of course, where we can hardly imagine life, life before us. It was an American surgeon, William Halstead, who invented surgical gloves in 1889. His head nurse, Mary Hampton, was allergic to the harsh new antiseptic used in the theater. Halstead commissioned the Goodyear Rubber Company to make Mary the first pair of surgical gloves. Not to protect the patient, but to protect the surgical staff. Halstead's true motives for keeping her hands supple became apparent the next year, when the couple were married. After it was realized gloves also prevented the spread of infection, other familiar items such as masks, hats, and gowns were quickly developed as surgeons sought to cover up. The final weapon against infection was the ability to fight it from the inside. The discovery of penicillin and its antibacterial properties eventually led to the full arsenal of antibiotics and antiseptics we have today including the iodine Gary Stoles is covered in as he is prepared for his hard bypass operation. Thoroughly scrubbed and safely isolated behind gowns, masks, and surgical drapes, his surgeons can be confident infection is not a risk as they prepare to take his life in their hands and open up his chest. Gary is now safe from pain and germs but his body is about to undergo a shock. To gain access to Gary's sick heart and perform the bypass operation, surgeons first split his breastbone. To control bleeding and shock, 
diatherm machine cauterizes the sides of the cavity. Yep. Yep. Let's go. As Gary's heart is exposed by one team, another begins to harvest the vein from his leg to be used to provide the graft material. Every cut is made with skill and precision in order to subject Gary's body to as little trauma as possible. Unfortunately, this level of care is very much a modern phenomenon. The earliest deliberate cuts into the human body are mysterious holes in ancient skulls. The operation was called tree panning, and evidence of it comes from all over the world, the oldest being 12,000-year-old skulls from Peru. While some bear the unmistakable marks of war, others show more deliberate mutilation. It is thought many skulls were open for ceremonial reasons, and ancient writings speak of letting the light in or evil spirits out. Tree panning continued into the 1500s, where it was often a last-ditch attempt at curing the mentally ill. At the same time, the arms race between those trying to make holes in the human body and those trying to repair them continued. But treatment could be just as cruel as the injuries themselves. To control bleeding, surgeons cauterized wounds with red-hot pokers and boiling oil. It was a young military surgeon named Amboise Perry, who in 1536 finally found a better way. When he ran out of boiling oil during a battle, Perry tried a mixture of egg yolk and rose oil on wounds instead. Hardly surprisingly, it worked better. He went on to revolutionize the control of bleeding in amputated limbs by inventing the ligature system of tying off blood vessels. As swords and clubs gave way to guns and bombs, the holes in patients got bigger and surgeons were forced to keep up. Attempts have been made to transfuse blood into wounded patients since biblical times, but most mysteriously failed. It wasn't until World War II that surgeons were finally able to pump blood in as fast as it was gushing out. Transfusions were given in ambulances and even on the actual battlefield. The establishment of blood banks with thousands of civilian volunteers meant an ample supply of blood was available. Tons of blood plasma, which could be stored indefinitely, were shipped to the battlefields of Europe. Soldiers could now be patched up, shipped back to the front, and have brand new holes made in them. Thousands of men, thanks to plasma, will come home to their thankful families. The whole world of peace to come will reap the benefits of this great wartime medical discovery. Science has won another victory over death. From the ashes of war, another branch of surgery left the head. Major advances in reconstructive surgery led to a revolution for its more glamorous twin, cosmetic surgery. At last, Mankind's age-old quest for the perfect face became possible. When we imagine people, we imagine what we can see of people, and in most cultures, that's the face. And indeed, surgery to the face to restore lost parts, especially the nose, uh, is part of the origins of the notion of both reconstructive and cosmetic surgery. The nose uh, is for the longest time the sort of centerpiece for surgeons. You lost your nose if you were a soldier in war, it was cut off. If you were an adulterous woman in India, it was cut off to punish you. Um, there were diseases like yours, and then after the 16th century syphilis, that caused the degeneration of the cartilage of the nose. So surgeons then had a job. Their job was to try to reconstruct the nose. And it was an Italian surgeon by the name of Tagolo Cozzi in the 1580s who developed the first modern skin graft to replace the nose. He took a graft from the top of the arm, 
tied your arm to the top of your head, connected the graft to where the nose was, and held it that way for three to four weeks. It was unpleasant. It was very painful. No anesthesia, of course, in the 16th century. And there was a really, really high chance of infection. But people were willing to undergo such surgery because of the social stigma and the physical discomfort, of course, of not having a nose. We, of course, see the face, but we fantasize about the rest of the body. And certainly what we call primary and secondary sexual characteristics, the genitalia, the breasts, have been surgically enhanced and changed for a very long time. The idea of going under the knife when you didn't have to would have seemed insane a hundred years ago. But today, millions of surgical procedures take place each year out of sheer vanity. Surgery has traveled so far that we can now ignore pain, infection, and shock and concentrate on more important things like adding some bumps and removing others. The two biggest aspects of cosmetic surgery are breast surgery and body contouring. And the thing that revolutionized body contouring is suction assisted lipectomy, which came into being in the late 1970s when a French surgeon named Deleuze came up with the idea that you could take a blunt, hollow cannula and hook it to a suction device and remove large volumes of fat. Uh, through small incisions, and that's reached the point where now that is actually the most common cosmetic surgery operation. Some people have surgery just to feel better, too. Ancient cultures drilled holes in the skull to achieve a higher level of mental clarity. Pete Halverson decided to put the theory to the test. In 1973, I uh, trade pad myself in um, Holland, and my instruments all pre-sterilized, and was gloved up and had my goggles on, and my little rain gutter here to keep blood from dripping down into my eyes. So then made a T-shaped incision, spread the flaps open, and I drilled through the hard top layer of bone into the soft middle layer and the drilling went very quickly there and then I came down onto the bottom layer of bone and at that point I knew that I had to drill very slowly and carefully and I had my friends standing by and we'd open the incision and clean it and get the powdery bone out of the way so that they could see clearly in and drilling very slowly I came down through the bottom layer and felt the drill give way a little bit and turned it off and pushed against it just enough to know that I was down on the flexible membrane below the bone. And I walked away and cleaned up and uh, slept sitting up right in the chair that night. Obviously, self-surgery is not for everyone. And Pete now is able to offer a much more reliable alternative for those who need tray padding, like they need a hole in the head. We've been able to set up a clinic in Mexico where very qualified surgeons of international reputation are doing trepanation as an elective procedure for anyone who wants it. You may not want a surgeon to drill holes in your skull, but at least they are now trained to do it safely if you change your mind. Modern surgeons must study for years before they're able to make the smallest incision, but for most of history, the words surgeon and qualified were never used in the same sentence. What's more, it was a mortal sin to even learn about the inside of the human body. Back then, you were probably better off doing it yourself. Gary's heart has now been deliberately stopped in preparation for the bypass procedure. Surgeons have had to practically kill him in order to cure his entire blood supply is being diverted into a heart-lung machine, which both oxygenates it and pumps it around his body. His 
grip on life is slim, and the margin of error in the procedure very slight. To successfully complete the heart bypass and bring him back, his surgeon must be highly trained and have an intimate knowledge of anatomy. You would think knowing which bit is which inside the human body would have always been rather important for surgeons, but this was definitely not the case. For most of history, the human body was a sketchy map with here be dragons written on the blank bits. Surgery didn't exist as a specialty at all, and religious squeamishness about dissecting human bodies crippled the study of anatomy for thousands of years. The most famous ancient anatomist was Galen, who served as physician to the gladiators of Rome. Banned from studying humans, Galen dissected apes and pigs. His many mistakes stood uncorrected for almost 15 centuries. Galen's faulty anatomy was passed on by the only people who could actually read, monks. They applied it in the monastery hospitals until 1163, when all clergymen were forbidden to draw blood from the human body. Threatened with extinction, surgery fell into the hands of quite a different profession. Before banning surgery, the church also banned beards, meaning the monasteries were crawling with barbers. They became surgeons by default. Barber surgeons traveled the country performing simple operations. One of the most common was medicinal bleeding. Back in the Middle Ages, they would have a patient hold a stick. And what that would do is that would um, essentially engorge the veins of the arm. They would then put a tourniquet around the upper arm. All of these things would uh, make it easier to find a vessel to bleed. So the modern day barber pole is a representation of the pole, obviously the patients would hold on to. The white stripe around the pole is the tourniquet that they would put on the arm, and the red of a barber pole represents the blood. Anatomy finally took a final leap forward in 1543. A young Italian called Andreas Versilius made history by being the first medical student who could actually draw. His masterpiece, daringly based on real people, was called De Humani Corporis Fabrica. It is still considered the greatest contribution to anatomy in history. A series of internal feuds finally split the barber surgeons back into two professions in 1744, and after stagnating for 1,000 years, surgery could finally advance. However, restrictions on human dissection still stood, and newly founded medical schools were desperately short of study material. This led to one of the most infamous and gruesome episodes in the history of medicine, which took place in the graveyards of Edinburgh. By the 18th century, there were five medical schools in Edinburgh, and each of them had doctors of anatomy and skilled surgeons practicing to classes sometimes as packed as 500 students. These students were getting rather displeased by the smell of the classrooms because each doctor was only legitimately allowed by law one body per year, that of an executed criminal. This would, of course, make the classrooms rather unbearable to work in. And that was where the body snatchers came in. Local entrepreneurs soon realized there was good money to be made digging up fresh bodies and selling them to medical schools. In response to these resurrection men, as they became known, the authorities erected watchtowers at city cemeteries and reinforced tombs with bars and blocks until they resembled bank walls. Cunning inventors cashed in, peddling so-called safety tools to reassure the paranoid and critically ill. This, of course, led to a bit of a decline in the body snatching industry. But only until William Burke and William Hare came along. These two men decided to turn to body snatching in an altogether new and unique way. You see, they simply cut out the middleman. That middleman was natural causes. Burke and Hare prowled the underbelly of the city, luring its dwellers back to their flat, getting them drunk 
and smothered the man with a large pillow. The buyer of their fresh produce was Dr. Robert Knox, an ambitious young surgeon whose classes ominously promised an ample supply of anatomical subjects. Well, after about a year of uh, quite successful operation, in which the number of casualties may have been anywhere between 13 and 30, Birkenhair made rather a fundamental error, as all great criminals do. They decided to pick on a lady who happened to have quite a well-known body in some of the deprived areas of the city. Mary Patterson was a notorious prostitute. So when her body was publicly unveiled at the uh, much-heralded new anatomy lesson by Dr. Knox, Knox himself was rather surprised to recognize her body and be quite sure that he hadn't paid so much for it the previous time. Burke and Hare were immediately arrested and their trial became an international sensation. As part of a plea bargain, Hare testified against his good friend and on the 28th of January, 1829, in front of an eager crowd of 20,000, Burke was hung. But his punishment didn't finish there. It seems that Edinburgh's justices can be very ironic because Lord Meadowbank ordered that after the execution, Burke's body be carried across to the medical school where just like all of his victims, he too was dissected. In the wake of the Burke and Hare scandal, British Parliament passed the Anatomy Act of 1834, which guaranteed and regulated the supply of bodies for anatomical research. Medical sculptors created uncannily lifelike wax models, and the finest details of the human body were secret no more. <laughs> These days, anatomy and surgical training are in the hands of body builders rather than body snatchers. Limbs and Things is an English company specializing in creating accurate latex simulations of organs and body parts. There are religious and ethical issues associated with training on patients or on animal tissue in surgery. Muslim countries, lots of countries, um, training on, on animals or animal tissue is not at all acceptable. And in England particularly, you can't train on live animals at all. It's against the law. So there is a problem. And that's why we're here doing what we're doing. We have about 180 models. Um, and they range from a very basic skin pad for the use of topical skin adhesive right up to a pulsating heart model, which is used for coronary artery bypass procedures. Surgeons in training are able to practice on the models before even touching a real patient. This one simulates a bladder with various growths inside, which must be cut out. The student's work can be easily assessed and graded and standardized with classmates who are tested on exactly the same system. But the next frontier of anatomy lies with computer software. Tomorrow's dissections will be done with a mouse rather than a scalpel as virtual anatomy gives access to the human body in detail never before imagined. All without a drop of blood being spilled or a religious toe being stepped on. Thus, modern day surgeons possess a level of training and expertise that would have seemed miraculous to the region colleagues. Armed with this detailed knowledge of the human body, they were able to restart Gary's newly bypassed heart and bring him back from the dead. With the bypass grafts in place and Gary's heart beating again, all that remains is for the surgeon to close up. Even though the grafts cannot be seen, Gary will carry a reminder of the operation for the rest of his life, the scar from his incision. Soon, however, even this may be a thing of the past. 
One of the major surgical advances of the late 20th century was the development of laparoscopy. Rather than cutting the patient wide open, small holes or boards are made instead. Special instruments and a fiber optic camera are inserted, giving the surgeon full vision and control, and the patient smaller scars and a much faster recovery time. But another kind of surgery promises no scars at all. Thousands of patients travel from all over the world to the Philippines in search of a miracle cure for their ills. So-called psychic surgeons use no antiseptics, no anesthetics, and no instruments. They simply reach into the patient's body and magically pluck out diseased tissue. Or so it seems. I think it can be very, very convincing. Many of the people have been fooled by this. It's um, quite a compelling thing to see. Some tricks are done with mirrors. This one is done with towels. Pieces of animal guts and a blood bag are hidden beforehand in the surgeon's accessories. We've observed that the performer has in fact substituted fake blood pushed into the patient's stomach in, a such, a, in such a way that it appears as though their hand has, their fingers have gone in. In actual fact, they've, they've just put their hand into a fist, pushed downwards, and then with sleight of hand, using their other hand, move tissue across and then pull it up in such a fashion to, to make it look as though they're removing tissue from the patient's body. It's hard to get official statistics on psychic surgery because clearly most of it is happening underground and unofficially. But clearly there is a market for it in a number of developing countries because the, the real thing is going to be uh, too expensive for them. A quarter of the world's population have no access to modern medicine due to poverty and isolation. But state-of-the-art surgery is becoming available in new ways. Mario Chan is a Kichi Indian of Guatemala. Since he was young, a cataract has blinded his right eye. Now a team of Western surgeons have traveled to help him. One of the most amazing things is, is uh, being able to bring modern surgical techniques to um, places like uh, Guatemala, these remote areas yeah, of different nations around the world. And of course, having a ship, it makes it really easy because we just bring the whole surgical suite with us. The Caribbean Mercy is an ex-Norwegian ferry, now decked out with cutting-edge surgical technology. With her highly trained staff, she can travel virtually anywhere in the world to provide expert medical attention to those who desperately need it. Cataract surgery that we do on board here is uh, fake emulsification surgery. It's um, one of the, the, the best techniques, really. It's a very quick technique. The technique uh, involves just making a very small incision in the eye uh, after some anesthetic, and then putting a probe in, which breaks up the lens and then extracts it, sucks it out. Unfortunately, Mario's cataract proves too dense to be broken up with ultrasound. As his brother watches anxiously, the Mercy ship team decide to physically remove his entire lens. A plastic replacement is gently slid in, and Mario's vision and light are restored. The next day, his family wait anxiously for his return. With no way of communicating with the mainland, they have all been worrying about him. None of them have ever visited the doctor before, let alone been taken away to have surgery. Mario's sister is especially glad to see him. The cost of the organization is about $150 to do an eye, which is really nothing 
compared to the incredible life-changing effects that it has on people. It's a small cost to pay to give someone's life back. But the life savers of tomorrow may not even be human. In the mid-1990s, a small group of surgeons around the world began to think, you know, is there any way we could make cardiac surgery less invasive? To have your entire breast bone split and your uh, chest widely spread open and also to go on the heart lung machine is quite an insult for the body. You'd ideally like to have no incisions. And that would really be ideal. Laparoscopy was the obvious choice. But even the best cardiac surgeons found it was beyond their middle fingers to operate within the cramped chest cavity. It was not humanly possible. But there are other ways. Meet Zeus, a surgical robotic system who is going places his human colleagues can't. The advantage of a robotic system is the handle does not necessarily need to be attached to the instrument tip. My motion is mechanically uh, relayed to a computer system which digitizes the motion. Now that my movement is in a digital form, we can manipulate that movement and perfect it, if you will, in the same way that computers perfect and manipulate any digital bit of information. We filter out all high-frequency motion, which basically eliminates all trouble. We then also can scale the movement. We can make very gross movements of the console and have that scaled down to a microscopic size inside the patient. So again, increasing your dexterity. But surgeons still need to see what they're doing. With both hands already occupied, a voice control camera was an elegant solution. In, stop, back, Back, move right, stop, save two. So that's a tremendously enabling technology in many ways, gives a surgeon really a third arm. Even though Zeus is still in development, this may be the operating room of the future. At the moment, the operator sits on the other side of the room, but there's no reason why this distance can't be increased dramatically. I think one area where remote surgery may become very useful would be in space. There you can imagine if you had someone up on the International Space Station for a year or perhaps going to Mars, you obviously are not going to have access to all the different surgical specialists when you make these long journeys. But if you had a surgical robotic system, perhaps, you could have that specialist uh, be able to perform surgery, perhaps assist a medic or someone up there in performing, you know, more complicated operations. Back on Earth, Gary is resting peacefully in intensive care. His complex operation a success. Thanks to many brave surgeons and even braver patients, our three age-old enemies, pain, infection, and shock, have been overcome and the pendulum swung from kill to cure. It's better to be living in a modern day surgery system rather than back where you didn't have much care for the patient in that day. And that's about as scary, isn't it? You think about it. <laughs> So how, how do we get back into how do we get back to Eva? So here's our collaborate and then you want to go. Hi everyone, we're just going to pull up a Prezi presentation for this module. <clears throat> so um, if you guys want to take a quick break, um, just Take a quick break, maybe five minutes, something if you need to run to the restroom or something like that. This Prezi will probably take about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. 
Um, so you'll be sitting again. So maybe we'll um, pull up the Collaborate screen before we start this too, just so we can make sure when everybody's back again. Oh, we had some chats. Um, I think that was the one. Okay. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Sorry, we weren't seeing the chat as you guys were putting these in. All we could see was the the video on our end. So, um, did anybody have any questions about the video or comments? We want to make sure that you're coming back because usually I show that video the very first day of fall semester. Um, but since we have a summer start, we did it in the summer. And usually there's about five people every year that don't show up the next day. So we want to make sure you guys are all coming back. So the video also, you guys, just so you know, it is in the um, CWI library and so she will post the link but a lot of times if you open that link up it's still going to ask for your CWI login and then what it's going to do is take you to films on demand it doesn't always take you right to that video um, there are times it does and times it doesn't and I don't know why but if you look for it then once you get on films on demand it's called um, History of surgery, barber surgeons is kind of how we yeah. found it. Um, it's a little bit different than the one I've shown in the past. I had an old VHS that finally got worn out, so I had to find something similar. So there are a lot of similar aspects to this one. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you get on it, just through the through the CWA library. So, um, so anyway, take a quick break. Um, it's 10:22. Why don't we just um, start at 1030 and then we'll get you guys out of here today. I did want to mention one thing to you, Angel. Um, something I noticed being on here, and I'm glad that I logged into to your class, um, but I'm having internet issues and to preserve being able to see you and still watch your lecture, it doesn't allow me to share my video when my internet connection is low. So, oh, really? um, yeah, uh, who was it? Kayla was talking about how she couldn't get her video to come on or something like that. Um, and I'm having the same issue. So if somebody's video is not coming up, that may be why. You think it's their internet service? It could very well be, yeah. Okay, so so they may need to go to a higher higher speed internet? That could be, or it could just be that it you know drops out momentarily. Um, I know I'm okay. having my internet looked at today, literally, because I've I've been having issues. But um, yeah, I'm not so sure what I'm going with. Sorry, if, some if similar was happening to me, so I think that's what happened at the beginning. Sorry, just interjecting there. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, one of the things I was going to suggest too, if you guys are in a spot where you're experiencing that, if you go to one of the CWI computer labs during these class times too and get on one of those computers, obviously you're going to want headphones, um, but that way you're going to be able to see the video and, and we'll be able to see you as well. So um, just an option. I asked Jordan about that kaleidoscoping. I'm like, how do I get rid of that? And he's like, it's just something that happens when you share your screen. I'm like, I, I got to figure out how to get rid of that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> annoying. I think that just yeah. Is it something we're supposed to like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks for being on again, Jordan. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. If I have to yeah. drop off, if my cable guy gets here, I'll let you know. But <laughs> Was it the old between 8 and noon? Uh, yeah, I think he said between 9 and 9 or something ridiculous like that. <laughs> between 2021 and 2024, <laughs> is that what he said? <laughs> Anytime, just stay home. Oh, just right. stay home. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you because I, I I said I have never used Collaborate. I always use Zoom and so I'm kind of getting a lesson in this today too. Not that yeah. I'll ever use it. I'll probably just go right back to Zoom in the fall if I need to. But yeah. I, I'm trying to see what the benefit is and, and 
the one benefit I can see, like we only have one Zoom account for the program. So, you know, you guys can do collaborate very easily on your own without having to worry about if somebody else is doing it. So Absolutely. it's nice to have options. Does anybody have any questions or concerns while we're waiting? I have you know, one I'm question. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Um. So the I think it was the modules that we print out, and as yes. we're reading, we fill it out. Um. I just wanted to yes. clarify: Do we turn those in when we're done, or that's kind of just for us? You don't have to turn them in, okay. but I would highly recommend that you do them because there are questions from those modules on your test. Okay. So essentially, yeah, so essentially those modules are used to help the students process the information and try to really understand it. So it's more for your benefit, but, but I'll tell you, you will do a hundred times better on your test if you do those modules. So then and you suggest you go back the modules. Yeah, go ahead, Carly. Ah, uh, sorry. Um so You're those good. and then you sit and then obviously the videos, those are the two main things that you would recommend like study tips or okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you definitely want to read the chapters, right? And then you have the modules and then you have the videos. So if you cover all three of those and know that information, you're going to do well on the exams. I, where this summer is your guys' first semester in this program, I didn't want to do a lot of busy work. I, I don't think it's necessary, but I want you to do the work for your benefit, not to turn it in because it's an assignment. So, so the big thing to do well in these classes, I would say read the material early. So read your material on Sunday or Monday so that when I present it on Wednesday, it's not the first time that you're hearing the material. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. And then, yeah, and then on Wednesday, if you have questions or concerns, you don't understand stuff, then we can address it on Wednesday instead of, you know, kind of panicking on Thursday or Friday or even Saturday night or Sunday night and going, oh, no, you know, I don't understand this or, hey, the module didn't pop up. But <clears throat> just being prepared for the lectures ahead of time. <clears throat> hey, you bet. All right. Are we ready? I'll give him two one more minute. Okay, ten thirty. <clears throat> I like it's bigger you don't want to be doing it and you know then you don't have distractions so if you um, if your badge doesn't work right away in fact um, I will check with Carla and see but I okay. can leave my badge with you and you okay. can get it so I will need it next week because we'll do the oh that's story. right so okay. then I'll just start week three okay so um, yours should probably be ready by, by then day. and I'll check next week and let you know more. okay so okay all right, well, I think, well, no, it's not quite 1030. I don't want to make, so now it is. Now I see it. Okay, so um, this is just kind of a brief, well, not real brief. Um, I have quite a few slides on this. Um, introduction in history. Um, I will go into a little bit of the history of surgery, although we just went into that on the video. And so um, some of it may be repetitive, uh, but I'll try and um, get through that part fairly quickly and then we're going to talk about the history of surgical technology and how our profession has evolved 
and then um, talk about the duties of surgical technologists, what we actually do in the operating room, and what the role of the circulator would be too. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with that. And we will also post this link to the Prezi on Blackboard as well, so that you guys will have um, an opportunity to go back over this if you want to before the test. Uh, and some of the things that I will talk about in this, or what I should say is some of the things you have read in chapter one of the book are not necessarily going to be on your first test. Um, there's a little section on the legal system in chapter one, and we will bring that one back up again when Angel covers the legal system. And then also hospital administration, there's a section as well on that that you're not going to be responsible for on this first test. It's really um, going to be covered in some other areas. But it's a short chapter, so read it anyway and then you're gonna be prepared for that. So I'm on, I'm on Angel's computer, so I have to kind of think where I am here. Um, so again, you know, just a quick timeline and evolution of, of surgery. And I think the video obviously is a lot more graphic than what we're gonna be, I'm gonna be showing you. So probably got a really good idea of what um, goes on there. But the earliest things that we talked about in the video too were uh, the trephination that happens um, on skulls. And they used to do this for various reasons. If people had headaches or if they had a head injury um, and maybe blood was accumulating underneath the skull, they just decided they were gonna put holes in the skull and let the demons out as well as the blood. I guess the demons would come out with the blood, I don't know. But anyway, it's what's funny about this is that we still do a very similar procedure in surgery called burr holes and so if somebody does have a head injury and they have an accumulation where they have either an epidural hematoma or subdural hematoma a lot of times they are going to put burr holes in the skull very similar to this um, to relieve the pressure on the brain so this isn't that unusual and then as far back as um, 600 bc um, this Shirhuta was, was regarded as his founding father of surgery, and he actually invented um, plastic surgery, mostly rhinoplasty. And they mentioned in the video, too, that there, especially because of wartime, there were a lot of noses that were lost during war. Either they were cut off with swords or if there was an explosion or something like that. And so he figured out a way to do rhinoplasty. And I I did some other research on this guy a few years ago, and he actually had written not not so much a book, but he wrote information down for surgeons saying that they should be um, very clean, they should wash their hands, um, they should present themselves professionally to their patients. And so something that we regarded as just barbers um, in the 1500s, they actually had been far more advanced back in 600 BC on what surgeons um, should, how they should present themselves, um, how clean they should be. Um, they didn't believe that a surgeon should have long hair and things like that, even though the styles of the time were long hair. Um, so then, you know, jumping way fast forward um, in the 1500s, the English barbers and surgeons united they actually formed their own association called the United Barber Surgeons Company. And they performed things like tooth extractions, bloodletting. So again, anytime they felt that someone had evil demons or they were sick and they didn't know why, they would just um, do what's called bloodletting where they would just let a bunch of blood out of the patient. And hopefully not so much that they would die, but enough to cleanse them. Um, and supposedly that was gonna take care of all their problems. They did amputations and all of those things back then. So then um, jumping a little bit further ahead then um, in the 1800s, um, they did the first transfusion of human blood and they showed that in the video too, but what they didn't understand at that time was that we had different types of blood and so they couldn't figure out why people were dying. Um, when they first started to do blood transfusions, they thought they could do animal to human and that would work. 
And then they, um, when all of their patients died very quickly, they understood, okay, well, I guess we can't use animals, but I bet we can use humans. And so they would do humans um, human to human, and those patients um, a lot of times still died. They got lucky sometimes when a patient had the same blood type, but not every time. And so then at some point, someone figured out that there was a different type of blood typing, and they would take it from um, one patient to another with syringes and just in you know pull a syringe of blood from one patient, insert it into the next patient. So it was very rudimentary. They didn't understand that you could actually hang the blood in a bag um, and do it um, through through a vein. So that took, took a while before we actually had real blood transfusions. Um, they did their first hysterectomy in England in about 1843. So all of these procedures that you guys are going to be doing in a few months are relatively new when you look at Back in, in BC, how um, they were doing some procedures, but they didn't figure out that you could remove organs and things like that to help a, a patient survive. So um, a lot of these things are relatively new. Uh, again, they talked about this in the video too, but the first public use of ether as an anesthetic, um, that was one of the obstacles that needed to be overcome before we could perform modern surgery. It was infection, anesthesia, um, pain control, all of those things. And so, you know, they couldn't do anything without that. Um, first woman surgeon ever in America was in 1855. And now you're gonna find that it's probably about half and half. We have a lot of um, female surgeons, um, even female neurosurgeons, female orthopedic surgeons. Kind of historically, we've had a lot of female OBGYN surgeons for obvious reasons. They feel like women would rather go to a female. Um, so we have a lot of female OBGYNs. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are better than male surgeons. In fact, a lot of them aren't, I would say. <laughs> but now we're seeing it in a lot of specialty areas too. First appendectomy, 1855, first heart surgery in 1893. Um, a lot of people did not regard this as heart surgery because it didn't really treat the heart, it treated the pericardium, but just to take that step to be able to go in and have enough confidence to, to get that close to the heart, I think opened up a whole new world of medicine there. And then um, first successful open heart surgery was in Germany in the late 1800s. So then we're in the 1900s. Um, they actually started doing corneal transplants at that time. The first documented plastic surgery um, in real times, not in BC times, was um, in in 1917, um, they started doing sex reassignment surgeries um, in 1930. And this is an area that we don't really get into too much during um, the early part of the program, but in the capstone program that you guys, or capstone course that you guys will take in the spring, we get into a lot of gender reassignment surgeries, uh, male to female and female to male. And so you'll understand um, what goes on, you know, with those surgeries, the anatomy, how how um, the psychological aspect of, of going through that is too. So we will get into that at that time. Um, first total hip was in 1940, and 1950 is when we started doing organ transplant, and now organ transplant is extremely common. Um, the first first patient that they had did die because of a graft rejection. And so that was before they understood a lot of the um, re anti-rejection drugs that have to be administered to a patient going, going through any type of um, organ transplant or limb transplant, things like that. And then 1952, first successful heart surgery. And then right after that, um, they started using the heart-lung machine. And then again, into the, in the 1900s, um, live li living kidney donor transplants came in, um, pancreas, livers were transplanted, heart transplants. So as you can see, from the 1950s to the end of the 1960s was really when they started doing a lot more transplant surgery and 
kind of perfecting it and now like I said it is very common and so we'll talk about that too in the capstone course in the spring semester we don't get into a lot of that um, the first semester but we'll definitely get into it the second semester or the third semester um, 1975 was the first um, what they called keyhole surgery which is laparoscopic or minimally invasive um, test tube baby was born in 1978 um, artificial heart in the 80s. Um, they actually had a, um, I'm sure most of you guys are too young to remember this, but I remember it pretty well. A pediatric patient survived with the heart of a baboon. And I think that's one of the only times that they have tried to transplant a animal heart into a human. It wasn't successful. And so I think for ethical reasons, they've decided not to do it, do it again. So, um, but I remember it was on the news every single day how this child was doing. And then um, obviously she did pass away. Um, 1985 is the first documented robotic surgery. Um, robots are used very commonly now. And as Angel said, that's one of the things that they'll show you on your tour next Monday. Um, we have one here in the lab, but it's now obsolete, even though we've only had it probably five years. It was one that St. Al's donated to us, and um, now we can't get the drapes for it. We can't get um, the instrumentation we need for it. So it sits in the corner and looks really cool <laughs> when you walk in, but we, we don't use it here. But you'll get plenty of that experience when you get to the hospital. Um, they started doing hand transplants. Now they're doing like double limb transplants, things like that. Um, again, this is an area that has evolved because of war. A lot of the patients that come back from Iraq and Afghanistan have had, you know, maybe both arms blown off and um, both legs. And I was at a conference a few years ago and got to meet the first recipient of a double arm transplant, and he was an Iraqi. Um, soldier, he lost both arms and both legs, and he was going to be the first double arm or double leg transplant that they were going to try, and they gave him the choice, which would you rather have? And he said, well, I'd rather have my arms transplanted because I can always have artificial legs um, and be able to walk, or I can use a wheelchair, but I can't brush my teeth, I can't go to the bathroom by myself things like that. So he really wanted to have the double arm transplant and it's been very successful. Um, there was some scare right at the beginning that he was going to reject one of the arms, but, um, and they kind of develop a rash and some peeling and things like that on the arms or whatever limb they're transplanting. And he started to develop that and they were really afraid he was losing one, but then they were able to resolve that and he's doing really well with, with those arms. So it's, it's pretty cool. So we will talk a little bit about that in the capstone course as well. Um, and then cyber knife, which is a combination of robotics and imaging for the treatment of intracranial tumors. Most of these are done more in interventional radiology now. Angel, I think they started doing started out doing these in operating rooms, but now they do them in interventional radiology units instead. Um, anybody have any questions for me? I can't see your faces right now with this up, but um, feel free to interrupt or anything. Does anybody want want to ask anything? Okay, and so early 2000s and the Da Vinci, that's the name you're going to hear all the time is a Da Vinci <laughs> robot. And not that that's the only one out there, but is the most commonly one used. I think St. Al's has they have two. They have two. Jordan, how many do you guys have at Meridian now? We still just have the one, but they're threatening to give us another one, I think. Oh, do they want ours? <laughs> I can give them ours. <laughs> That's an expensive paperweight. It is. Ask him though. Yeah. We could take our door out again and have it have it transplanted, transferred over there. Um, and then St. Luke's downtown, I know at least two. They might they may even have three. I think they, have they do three. have three, yeah. yeah. So the problem with these is, yeah, they are expensive and once they become obsolete and the hospitals want something new then the, um, the company stops making things that make these worthwhile. 
So I, I was really excited. I think I was the very first program in the United States to get a Da Vinci robot. And that excitement wore off in about a year because we couldn't get anything to make it really work well for us. And uh, so people are always asking me now when I go to conferences, hey, do you still have that Da Vinci? And I'm like, yeah, would you like it? Because I can get that shipped out to you. So. In moment, that was the eighth Da Vinci in the whole nation made. Yeah, it should go to the Smithsonian because it, yes. it is, yeah, the eighth one in the whole nation. So, um, so then again, we started doing um, natural orifice, transluminal endoscopic surgery, and I don't know about Jordan and Angel, but I haven't seen a lot of this done. Um, so. If you think about natural orifice, okay, so we have we have the rectum, we have the vagina, we have the mouth. Well, vaginal sur surgery has been done vaginally for for years and years, and so it, that's nothing new. But then they started doing some transluminal surgery. Um, they tried to do a gallbladder removal, I believe, through the mouth, and I think that was successful. But I don't think you're going to see a lot of this. Um, it, yeah, no, we maybe do some endoscopic surgery um, for brain tumors. Mm -hmm. that, you know, you'll see them go through the nose and you have to have an ENT surgeon there. But our hospitals aren't, I think, to that point yet. Yeah. And it's probably still in the trial stages before they get everything finalized. Yeah, I think so, too. All the kinks so. worked out. There, I, you know, it sounds good, but you also then have a risk of infection mm -hmm. going through these um, yes. natural orifices, whereas if you go through an incision in the abdominal cavity and into the peritoneal cavity, those structures are considered sterile. And so you're going, if you're doing a natural orifice surgery, you're going into an unsterile area, into a sterile area. And I, I don't see the real benefit at this point, especially since we have so many other ways to do minimally invasive surgery. Um, but anyway, I just can tell you what that is. Um, and then 2008, um, Connie Culp has the first near total face transplant performed at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, this is an area that I, I went to a session on at our national conference a few years ago, and the surgeon who performed this was the one who spoke. And um, in fact, the whole surgical team, the surgeons, and then a couple of the surgical technologists that were on there were speaking too. And so it was really good. Uh, but this, this is um, being used now, again, because of war, you know, people have their faces, unfortunately, blown off. I think this person um, was someone who had her, she may have been the one that was attacked by, attacked by a chimpanzee, if, if I remember correctly, um, and had her face really destroyed. And so this is an area too that we will cover in our um, capstone course in the spring. So we talk about this quite a bit. So some of the things that are, are, are newer that um, we never even see, but they're things that you may see later on in your career. So we try and touch on those in the capstone course. And then um, they did a synthetic tissue engineered windpipe um, with stem cells. So you're going to see a lot more surgeries being done with um, stem cells. We are actually doing some of those in orthopedic surgery right now where they take um, juvenile PD stem cells um, to grow cartilage in a patient. So this is becoming a little bit more common. Um, they're doing nerve trans transfer surgery. So a nerve from one person to another. Um, so again, it's kind of a, a way of transferring nerves, um, kind of a transplant type thing. And then they're actually transplanting penises. Who knew that they would do this? Um, but for someone possibly that was in a, uh, some sort of accident where they lost one, um, that was in 2014. And so again, depending on where you're working, you may come across some of these things. And then the first uterus transplant, um, again, at the Cleveland Clinic, they seem to be kind of on the forefront of a lot of the newer procedures that are coming out. So that's kind of it as far as the timeline, and it's it's not all inclusive. Obviously, there's so many other 
um, great things that have happened during surgery, but just to kind of give you an idea of how all of this has come to be, you know, we haven't been doing transplant surgery for the last 200 years. These things are all relatively new. Um, we haven't even been removing gallbladders for the last 200 years. That's new. So um, a lot of a lot of the new advances have taken place really just in the last 20, 25 years. I started scrubbing in 1989. So when I graduated from school, and at that time we had just started doing um, laparoscopic gallbladder removal, so lap coles, and it was kind of a big thing at that time. There was only certain people that were allowed in the laparoscopic room, and now it's like you can't get away from them. There, you're going to do a lot of laparoscopic surgery. Um, and, and lasers even, I can remember there was a laser team, only one person could run the laser and now everybody runs the laser. So um, you'll, you'll find that a lot of the things that you know, have just really evolved in the last 30 years as being just commonplace now. Any questions? So can you guys see that? Some weird thing. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just have a question. It, how much of those dates, like, do we need to know for the test? Um, <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I I knew someone was going to ask that. It's I like, just didn't, oh my God. I, it's a lot of dates, so I didn't want to try and study all of them, and then yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's just kind of informational, just to kind of um, so you guys understand what kind of how things evolve. And I don't know why this screen all of a sudden got really big here. Are you guys able to see the words or is it being cut off on your it's end too? Off. Okay, so yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. It's kind of weird. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, yeah. all right. So surgical technology, obviously, and you guys are gonna run across this a lot in your career. You're gonna tell people you're a surgical technologist and they're gonna go, they're either gonna think you're a surgeon, which is kind of cool when they do that, or they're gonna think you're a nurse, um, which is not quite as cool. But um, so they're gonna, and then you're, you're gonna say, well, no. So what, what people don't understand is that the sterile team up at the field with the surgeon is made up of a surgeon. There's always going to be a surgeon, and we'll talk about who, who can be a surgeon and who can't. And there's always going to be someone assisting them. And that's going to be the surgical technologist. And there could be another assistant who could be a a surgeon, another surgeon, another physician, or a PA, or another CST. So when you're explaining this to people, the best way to explain it is I, I assist the surgeon up at the sterile field because people still are not going to know what you do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those areas that the general public doesn't have access to. Everybody knows what a nurse does. Everybody knows what her you know, an x-ray tech does, but you say surgical tech, you know, and, and always use the term surgical technologist. You are a technologist, not a technician. So get the technician name out of your head right now, um, because we'll correct you all the time in class if you say it, because you are, you are going to be an expert in that area. So you deserve to be called a technologist. Um, so I, when I tell people I teach surgical technology, they think I'm teaching surgeons, which again is kind of cool, but I have to correct them. I don't want to mislead anybody. But the very first, what they, what they determined were really the very first surgical technologists were called surgery beetles. And in the British hospital system, they had porters and beetles. And we think of them kind of as orderlies now but they started using their beetles um, to do everything from bringing patients into the hospital. They would make candles um, so that they could light up the rooms and things like that. But then um, one time a surgeon in Britain had, had thrown a nurse out of his room because the nurse didn't know how to start or to insert a, a drain for him. And he had, the beetle, who was um, the porter in the room, 
come up to the field instead and help him and he was more useful so they made him they they started calling them surgical beetles which is really the very first surgical technologist and so then they started using their their beetles that were normally you know transferring patients and making candles and things like that um, to help them in surgery and assist in surgery so that's kind of where that came from um, but the biggest need for surgical technologists really occurred because of both wars. So during both world wars, and if you look at World War I and World War II, they were literally almost back to back. And so we just had barely started to recover from World War I, well, we hadn't really recovered when World War II hit. And so you have all of these um, medical mass units that were being set up all over the world and there were not enough nurses to fill the roles and so they started training medics in the army to to scrub in and help the surgeons um, and then they it kind of went the opposite way for a while too where the nurses said well no we should be up the field with the surgeons and these medics should be doing all the paperwork um, and that's exactly opposite as it the way it is right now. So the the circulators who are RNs in the room, they're the ones that do the paperwork. They'll help anesthesia. They go get the patient and everything else. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So just not trying to confuse you, but just the the profession kind of evolved at different times and our role um, evolved and changed a few times until then after the Korean War, they started referring to us as operating room technicians or ORTs and we were assisting surgeons at that time. So it was kind of in the 50s is when they actually developed the ORT um, acronym. So we actually had a definition to our name or a title to our name. Um, so again, Korean War hospitals experienced a shortage of operating room nurses, civilian hospitals began hiring war seasoned men who had been trained by the, the United States military. So a lot of the early surgical technologists came out of the military. And then in 1973, they changed the name of an ORT, an operating room technician, to a surgical technologist. And then major hospitals and universities um, started developing standardized surgical technology certification training programs. So initially, they were all certification programs or diploma programs. Um, this is the very first year that all programs across the United States are required to be associate degree programs to maintain their accreditation. Uh, because of COVID, they have given some of these programs an extension, but I think that extension um, just goes until um, fall of 2022. So this has been in the making for quite a long time. We've had our associate degree option for probably the 10, I don't know, 10 years since we've been with CWI, but it was always an option and 99% of the class every year would complete that and they would take this course in the summer. So this is the first summer that we have our recent graduates completing their associate degree this summer with one class. And then we have you guys starting in the summer. So. As I said, it's mandatory now that all surgical, surgical technologists in the country um, come out as with their entry level degree of an associate degree. So that's really good news for our profession because we fought really hard to be on par with other allied health programs like um, rad techs and med techs and some of these other programs that have always had associate degrees so when you go, you start looking at pay differences for someone with a certificate and someone with an associate degree, they would always look at surgical technologists and think, well, you guys are just, you know, a certificate program, you don't have a degree. And now everyone going forward will graduate with a degree in surgical technology, not a certificate in surgical technology. So, so yay, congratulations, you guys, you're the first here. Well, kind of the first. Um, 
So then in 1978, or to get something here, um, so today the Association of Surgical Technologists, which is AST, and I'll talk about them again in this, and the National Board of Surgical Technologists and Surgical Assistants oversee the national exam and the certification. So AST, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, but anyway, your credential will come from the national board. AST does um, more the educational part, and we'll, we'll talk about that as I go on. So then in 1978, and again, don't worry about the dates. I'm just kind of trying to give you a timeline, um, unless you want to put all those dates on their test, yeah. Angel. Okay. <laughs> she says no, but she can change your mind, too. Um, change their name from Association of Surgical, of OR Technicians to AST. So now forevermore, it will be known as the Association of Surgical Technologists. Okay, what's going on with this now? Here's my. Huh. It's bad. It's super sensitive. Oh. Don't mean to alert. Make it bigger. Let's see. It's just not clicking forward. Okay. Let me click on that one. Okay. Um, anyway, I don't know why it's doing that. Usually I can just push forward, but. So one of the other things that um, happened in 1997, again, you don't need these dates, but um, in Britain, they have a little, and these are the first surgical beetles. They are now um, called operating department assistants. And then they changed their name or were called operating department assistants. And now they are um, operating department practitioners. And so their training closely aligns with the training that we have in the United States, although they get to actually do a few other things. They, they um, participate a little bit more in anesthesia as well. So they get curriculum training as an anesthesia technologist as well as a CST. And so theirs is a little bit, just, just takes them a little bit further um, that way they can fill a bunch of different roles in the operating room. And it's not to say that some hospitals don't use um, CSTs as anesthesia technologists, but we don't have the formalized training associated with our degree as they do. So um, anyway, they've tried to streamline things um, between the two countries so that it is pretty much the same, but um, our very strong nursing lobby in the United States has kind of prevented some of that from happening with um, surgical technologists, whereas um, they see the value in Britain of our training and our profession. And instead of trying to squelch some of the things that we can do, they have tried to enhance it a little bit more. So more on that later. All right, yeah, this is not moving forward. I don't know what's going on. So I'm not sure why this Prezi doesn't want to move forward, but um, well, can you click uh, maybe this. if I do? You see that yeah, okay, that's where it is. See, I'm not seeing it on the computer at all. Let's see. Okay. It's hidden on my computer, so. Um, see, it has taken me into some weird areas. I think I went, I think I went way too far forward, you guys, so. Yeah, I did. That's weird. Okay. So that was the timeline of surgical technology. We're going to go into the timeline of the organizations that I talked about. So this you do need to know. I'm not going to give you dates or anything like that, but these are really important for you guys to know. They will be on the test. Um, so there's a couple, well, there's about four different professional organizations that you will start becoming very familiar with. And I grouped them into two different areas. So there's two professions that really affect you as students and as a professional. And those are, so again, AST, the Association of Surgical Technologists. And I suggest you guys go to their website and kind of play around, look at different things. Uh, you'll all become members of AST right before the spring semester. 
um, and then you'll start getting their journal and things like that. We don't do it until you're closer to um, taking the certification exam because we get a bundle for your membership, a study guide, and then paying for your certification exam. But you know, definitely go to their website. Um, I think there's an area in there for, for students. I, the website recently kind of changed some things, so um, I'm not quite as familiar with they put student things, but definitely go in there and look around at it. But they have developed a code of ethics for surgical technologists. Um, so you might search for that on their website. Also a job description, um, what a sur surgical technologist does. Um, we've also developed guidelines for best practice. And you'll hear when you go to the hospitals, everybody will always say, well, AORN says this, and that's the Association of Operating Room Nurses. But what a lot of places don't realize is that AST also has guidelines and um, we used to call them standards, but we don't call them standards now. They're all guidelines for best practice. And we have developed our own. And fortunately, now a lot of the hospitals are referring not only to what AORN says, but also to what AST says. And so if you kind of search through those areas, you'll see some of those. Um, I've been on the National Ed Committee. This I'm just going off in July. I've been on it for six years now. And that's one of the things that we do is we write and revise those guidelines. Um, anything we do then gets out put on the website for public comment. So, you know, other CSTs can look at it and say, yeah, that, that looks good, or I would change this, we're seeing this at our hospital, those type of things. So we always put those out there before they are, um, go through the final approval process with the board of directors at AST. Um, and then they've also created the educational text. And so the textbook that we refer to as your AST text, which is the big hardcover one, that was written by AST. Now, there's not, it's not to say that there aren't other textbooks for surgical technologists out there. Um, the module books that you guys have are not written by AST. So we do kind of um, try to break it up a little bit, but we don't want to make you buy six different textbooks that basically have a lot of the same information. So we've just decided to stick with the AST text and then those module books, which I feel have been really valuable. Um, so anyway, take some time when you have some free time and go through that, um, go through that website. Yeah, if I can see it. Oh. So then the other um, organization that is for students and professionals is the National Board of Surgical Technology and Surgical Assisting. This used to be called the Liaison Council, and so you might see it that way sometimes, but it's been at least 10 years since they changed their name, so it sh you shouldn't see anything um, with that anymore, but you, you might. So if it says the LCCST, it just means the Liaison Council um, for Certification on Surgical Technology, but now this includes Surgical Technology and Surgical Assisting, um, there's their website. Um, this is who we use when you guys go to take your exam at the end of the year and then also when you recertify. So every two years you will have to recertify once you're certified. Um, you'll have to have 30 continuing education credits and we'll talk more about that as we go on and how you earn those credits. Um, and then you will have the, the CST credential. So then you'll be able to call yourself a certified surgical technologist. And we're happy to say that everyone in the class did pass this year. We Yay. usually have we usually have a hundred percent pass rate. Every once in a while we have one person that doesn't pass when they take it with the class at the end of the year, but then they take it immediately again and they pass. So um, I can honestly say in the 20 years that I've been teaching, there's not one person who went through our program that did not become certified. It may have taken a few people more than once, and by a few, I mean very, very few um, people more than once to pass it. Um, usually we do have a 100% pass rate, so. It, in your book, it says uh, uh, recertification is every four years with 60 credits. 
So just know that the two years and the 30 credits is fairly new. I think mm -hmm. it was implemented in the last year, yeah. year or two. Mm -hmm. um, I won't be testing on that, but just so you guys don't get confused, it your book is just a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So it has your older certification uh, standards. Yeah. And that just, like Angel said, it just started this year. And so I had to recertify last year. So I'm still on a four-year cycle. But the next time I recertify, I will be on a two-year cycle. And what they did, they cut the price in half. They, they cut the number of CEUs required in half, everything. But the reason they decided to make it every two years was because four years um, was causing a lot of people to procrastinate and they would not earn their CEUs until the weekend before their expiration and they try and do a lot of online module, online CEUs, things like that. Um, and the other issue with that is if those CEUs are not approved and you haven't done things that are pre-approved, then you're going to be putting um, your certification on hold. They won't recertify you until you get everything in. Well, the hospitals here will not let you work. And I can um, count on both hands, every finger in the last two months, how many people have sent me emails about recertifying and they're panicking. And these are people that I I said to them, please never let your membership in AST lapse. And that's the other thing I should have brought up on the previous slide. When you become a member, every CEU that you earn, you send to them and they keep track of it. So when it's time to recertify, all you do is go to the national board and they pull all of those CEUs from AST and automatically, you know, with a small fee, I think it's like 50 bucks, you're recertified. If you're not a member of AST, um, you have to wait until right before your certification expires and you have to send all of your CEUs on a form into them. They have to process those and approve them. And if you've done some that don't count or you filled it out wrong or whatever, they're gonna send it right back to you. And then if your certification expires during that process, as I said, the hospitals are not going to let you scrub. And it used to be the hospitals were nice enough to maybe put you down in sterile processing during that time. Now they just tell you not to come back until, until you're recertified. So they have gotten very, very strict about it. Um, so again, every year I get students that, that, and I'll say, do not let your membership lapse. Stay a member. It's gonna, it's gonna make your life so much easier. And just yesterday, I got one from someone from two years ago. Hey, I'm not a member. What do I do? And I, I want to take them back to this lecture and say, if you'd like to attend my class, and I will go through this again with you. Um, so you're going to hear me say that over and over and over again, just so you guys know. So I don't want any texts from you guys next year asking what you do. Okay, so to be eligible to take the certification exam. You have to be a graduate of a KHEP or ABHES accredited program, and I'm going to talk about both of those in a minute, um, or you could current, you must currently be or previously have been a CST. So if you let it lapse, maybe you weren't scrubbing for some reason, you wanted to get back into it again, um, you, you are eligible to become recertified either through retesting, um, and that's never want to take that test again so keep up your um, or if you're graduated of an approved military program um, or previously certified one with a lapse membership and then surgical technology students before graduation so this is this is something we'll talk about throughout the next couple semesters too it gets kind of confusing but when you guys take the certification exam you're going to take it usually the day before or the day of graduation, just depending on when CWI holds their graduation. And they will not tell you your results that day. So what happens is I send them a letter that verifies who has met the requirements for graduation in the program. I send a notarized letter and then they release the results to me and then I can tell you if you passed or not. So. Um, 
what we will require that you guys do is at the beginning of the spring semester, you will then apply for graduation right at the beginning. And then we will ask that you send us the email when you get it that says, yes, you have been approved for graduation as long as you pass your, you know, the rest of your classes you're enrolled in. So that's our proof that we need before we put your name on this letter, um, the notarized letter. Um, and I had three students this past year when, and they just took it, took the exam about a month ago that did not do that. And the day before the exam, um, we were scrambling or they were scrambling. I was, I was very calm about it, but I just said, I'm not going to put your name on the letter that you've met the requirements for graduation because I can't even see that you've applied for graduation. And so it came down to hours before the certification exam when they were able to provide me that proof. Um, so again, you're going to hear us talk about this at the beginning of the spring semester and we're going to require it. So don't wait until the day before the exam to get us that information. So. Okay, so then I talked about, so those are your organizations that you need to be uh, aware of as a professional and as a student. These are the organizations that we are aware of as instructors in the program, as program directors. So we work with what's called the Accreditation Review Council on Education in Surgical Technology and Surgical Assisting, or ARC is what we call them. They will review and recommend accreditation for surgical technology programs. So every year at the end of the year, I have to fill out an annual report that has all of the data on our program as far as how many graduate or how many people we enrolled, how many people completed the program, how many people passed the certification exam, how many people are employed, if they're continuing their education, if they're not. So they look at that annually um, from the program. Um, then every 10 years, they will come and do a site visit. And fortunately, we just had one last year. So I'll be long gone before the next one comes, Angel and Jordan. Um, so, um, and, and it's a lot of information. We must have had, I don't know if you, if Jordan, if you can remember how many files that we had sitting down here in the lab that they will look through. So they look through the previous seven years of student records, um, case numbers, graduation numbers, all of those things. They spend an entire day just going through all of our files um, and then looking at things on our website and everything else. And then they recommend us for continuing accreditation. And so fortunately we passed, which um, there was never any doubt, but it's, it's a stressful time. So you guys are lucky you don't have to experience that with us like two years ago they did last year. Um, so the Accreditation Review Committee, they don't accredit us. So it's KHEP that accredits us. So KHEP is the Commission on Accreditation. So they won't grant accreditation until ARCST says yes. They, they, they have all of this, they have maintained all of the standards, all of the guidelines, um, and we recommend that they have continuing accreditation. So then KHEP sends us a certificate, says, yes, you are accredited. So those are the two organizations that we are um, mostly involved with that students usually don't have to worry about unless you are looking for a program. You want to make sure that it is an accredited program and that it has met all of those requirements. So that's where it comes comes in, but now you guys are already in an accredited program, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, the other one I mentioned, and I don't have anything on it here, um, is called ABHES, and that's an accreditation bureau on um, educational programs, and that one is more for um, schools that are like Brown Mackey Colleges or Carrington Colleges, things like that, and if they have that accreditation, they are also eligible to take the certification exam. Um, but it's only those two accrediting bodies uh, that allow a student to take the national boards. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
it's kind of hard. I can't see people nodding their heads. <laughs> so again, this is something you're going to need to know for the test. So go back over this too, so you understand it. Okay, so we are going to then talk about the role. So when you you know start to wonder what do we actually do in there? I keep hearing you know what we do, but I I can't visualize it yet. Hopefully this will help a little bit, but really until we're in the lab in the fall, a lot of this may not make as much sense. Hopefully when you guys go to the hospital on Monday, there'll be a case going on or two, and maybe you'll be able to go in and and observe for a little bit, um, just so you can kind of understand. Um, also, I'm wondering how many people have CWI IDs? Um, so let me see, how do we get back to collaborate there? The ID cards, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, yeah your CWI ID card, how many people have those? So I know I have mine, but I definitely need to renew it. So, but okay. I can, I've renewed it before. It's it's not that hard to renew it. So. Okay. So I I just want to if you guys do not have them, if you could go to one of the one stops, um, whether you live in Canyon County or Ada County, um, and get that ID card, um, that would be helpful. I I don't think it's going to be a problem at all because Angel will know who everybody is. Um, but it would. You know, because we've been doing this online, it'd be nice that you're not sending your twin sister or something like that in place of you um, because you have a concert to go to. So, um, and then also if someone at the hospital says, hey, do these guys actually have ID badges? Um, you can so, say, yes. well, we don't really have our badges yet, but they have CWI ID. So it'd be great if you guys could go do that. Um, you have a week now, or almost a week. Um, if not, if it's if it's going to be a, a problem for you, let's not worry about it right now. But I just actually thought about that, that when we go to the hospital, everybody usually does have an ID. So if you can get it, please do that. It's not going to prevent you from doing the tour, though, just so you know. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah. Some of those arrows there. are showing. Up. Yeah, they're not showing. Yeah, they're so tiny. They're there. They're just tiny. So. Okay. Okay. So, um, for a surgical technologist, and you'll see this acronym sometimes in the AST book. It's surgical technologist in the scrub role. Um, and they say that because there are times when you can be a surgical technologist and you're not scrubbed in. So we kind of are differentiating. So if you are in the scrub role, that means you're a member of the sterile team, that means you have scrubbed, you have gowned, and you have gloved, and then you are sterile and you can walk up to the sterile field and you can touch sterile items, things like that. Um, so you're delivering direct patient care by um, establishing the sterile field anticipating the needs of the surgeon. And so we do consider that direct patient care. Um, as a first scrub, and most of, the, most of the time when you are at the hospitals, you are going to be in the first scrub role. Um, so you are going to open up sterile supplies, prepare the sterile fields, you're gonna prepare and pass instruments, supplies, medication and equipment during surgery, and then you're gonna protect and maintain the sterile field. And I know a lot of that doesn't make sense right now because you haven't seen it, we haven't been there, but when you take this hospital tour, it's really gonna to start to make a little more sense. Um, if you are in the second scrub role, and sometimes a student kind of gets shoved out of the way, um, because the surgical technologist, it may be a really difficult case, or it may be that the surgical technologist who is acting as your preceptor is kind of unsure of the case themselves, and they don't want to put you in a position where you are going to become overwhelmed. So then you would be kind of relegated to the second scrub rule during that surgery. You may help with retracting, you might suction, um, with some hemostasis, and again, we'll talk about that again later. Um, you might be assembling and 
you know, wound devices at the end, section devices, and be able to help um, applying the wound dressing. But you haven't been the one that sets up the field. You're not passing most of the instruments and supplies and things like that. It doesn't mean you're not involved in the case. It just means that a lot of times it can be just a newer preceptor and they're a little insecure too and they don't know what you know how to do and so they're not going to let you do enough or, or as much and so you are considered the second scrub. So that'll start to make more sense too once we're in the lab next semester. Um, there are some states that allow surgical technologists to um, function in the circulator role and some don't. At Idaho, you'll typically not function as a circulator, but you may help the circulator out on certain cases if you were part of the non-sterile team. So if they just need someone in the room to help with things, you know, then you would kind of be an assistant circulator. Um, some hospitals may have one RN to four rooms and the CSTs are circulating the rooms as well, um, but they're kind of supervised by a nurse in that role. You're not supervised by a nurse when you were scrubbed in, you were supervised by the surgeon in that instance. Um, so in that, if you're part of the unsterile team, then you might deliver and prepare the non-sterile equipment. So you may be helping open supplies um, to the sterile team members. So if there are things that they need during the procedure that didn't get opened at the beginning, you're gonna open those for the sterile team. Um, you're gonna help with transferring, positioning the patient, you may perform um, urinary catheterization. Uh, we don't do a lot of that, but a lot of states, the CSTs do quite a bit more of that. And then um, you might help with the surgical skin prep as well. So then everybody always wants to know, you know, what are some of the other opportunities if I get tired of scrubbing, if I've done this for 10 years and I'm tired of getting up every morning and getting to the hospital by 6.30 and working hard all day, not that any of this is any easier. Um, so you could become, you know, someone on the, the trauma team. And so again, this isn't easier at all. It's just kind of a different schedule. And what a lot of um, hospitals that are trauma hospitals have are trauma teams. And so you would be, you know, working maybe one week on and one week off. And depending on how they schedule it, it could be 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and then weekends. Um, so one of my old um, clinical instructors that worked here with me for several years, she used to always say really what it is, it's a fancy name for working nights and weekends because you're getting whatever comes in. It may not be a trauma. It could be, you know, an appendectomy in the middle of the night or something like that. Um, so also we have quite a few CSTs that eventually decide they want to sell medical equipment. A lot of them are, a lot of it is orthopedic equipment, spine equipment, because they're used to those things um, in the operating room. So becoming a sales rep for a spine company or an orthopedic company. Um, more and more CSTs now are getting into leadership and management positions because of the advanced degrees people are earning. So even though you are going to come out of this program with an associate degree, you don't have to stop there. You can go on to BSU and get a bachelor's of applied science and you can get it in business and leadership and things like that. And then you can further your career um, by having that degree. So there's a lot of opportunities um, if you're if you're willing to go on. Um, you don't a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna go on to become a nurse. Well, you really should be a nurse if that's what you wanna do. If that's, if that's what you want, you should probably go to nursing school and not through this program because it's not nursing. Um, and it doesn't really lead to nursing. Uh, another thing you'll see is, you know, someone maybe they're a preceptor for students to new employees. That, that's not really a, a different role. You're fulfilling the same role, but you might be someone who is, assigned as a lead preceptor um, at a smaller place. So some of the smaller places that are, you'll go for your rotations like the VA or West Valley, we have one assigned preceptor there and that person then will take care of you as a student while you're there. They may not be with you all the time, but they'll assign you to other rooms too. So that's a role um, at some hospitals. Um, sterile processing management, um, the sterile processing manager at St. Al's happens to be a CST right now. 
if he wants to go back to scrub he does yeah so he just he just passed his exam oh good <laughs> So he, so the one that is managing right now at St. Al's, he is a surgical technologist, but he's actually wanting to get back into scrubbing again. So, so you know, you kind of go back and forth sometimes. Grass isn't always greener on the other side. Um, you could become a program director, a clinical coordinator, a clinical instructor. So all of the clinical instructors and Eric, um, who's our clinical coordinator, went through my program. So long ago. So I think Angel was probably the first one out of this group that went through. Um, we used to be at BSU and so she was actually one of my first students a long time ago. And then um, Jordan came next along the way. And then Alyssa and Eric, and, and Alyssa you won't see until the fall, but Eric, they were both in the same class in 2008. So they've all come through this program. Um, as most of the surgical technologists in the valley, you will know, came through this program. Um, there are some from Twin Falls area and maybe from out of state, but the majority of the, the preceptors that you will have um, precepting you when you're in the hospitals have gone through this program, so they're very familiar with it. Um, you can work for a tissue bank, and tissue bank is something that where they will retrieve heart valves, um, cartilage, tendons, um, skin, bone, things like that from a person who is dis deceased and maybe they were an organ donor as well and then they want to donate other parts of their body and so that patient is deceased at that time and they will um, take all of those other structures and then usually cremate the body after that. So um, we have, I've had quite a few students actually go into that and one from about, I don't know, 15 years ago, and he still works at the tissue bank. And he never, he never worked in a hospital again after graduating from the program. He went right to the tissue bank and has done it all these years. So he, he's kind of like that. Um, and then you could become a first assist or a CFA, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on to. Um, so again, areas of employment, which is a little different than um, you know, different careers, but the most, most people end up working in an operating room. If you're going into this profession, that's usually what you want to do, but there's also um, CSTs that work in emergency rooms or emergency departments, they're called now, at bigger hospitals and um, like New York City and some of the bigger places where they get a lot of traumas coming into their ERs, they actually um, staff it with CSTs too because they end up doing a lot of surgeries right in the operating room, a lot of trauma surgery there. Um, labor and delivery units hire CSTs as well for their C-sections and unfortunately a lot of people go into this thinking, oh it's going to be so fun, I'm going to deliver babies all day. Well, you might work for three or four days without ever seeing a C-section and what you're doing the rest of the time is kind of functioning as a CNA. So we always have one student a year that that's what they want to do. And as much as we try and talk them out of it, um, they still do it. And then after about three or four years of it, they get kind of tired and think, you know, I've lost a lot of the skills I learned doing other cases. I want to do something else. So, so just keep that in mind. Alexandria, don't tell Lindsay that we're saying <laughs> this. Yeah. If you're still oh. on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean there there's nothing better than you know seeing a baby delivered and everything else but it's it's not like you're gonna see it all the time if you work in that unit and I would say St. Luke's downtown if you really think that that's what you want to do maybe St. Luke's downtown is probably a little busier because the ones that we've had that have worked down there they seem to be getting more c-sections they yes. might get three a day which is great compared to, um, I think, what we're doing now. Yeah. So um, endoscopy units also hire CSTs. You don't have to be a CST to work in those units, but um, they will hire CSTs. Cardiac cath labs in some hospitals will hire CSTs. Um, again, the tissue and retrieval team, as I talked about, Burn units, we don't have a burn unit here in the Treasure Valley. Um, most of those patients are sent down to Salt Lake, but they have CSTs on that unit. Um, so same day or ambulatory surgery centers or units, um, freestanding at 
patient clinics, doctors' offices, um, a private scrub. And so in the previous slide, I mentioned bringing a um, first assist. And so a first assist is a little bit different than a CST. It's typically a CST who has been hired by a physician or a group of physicians um, to be their private scrub. And so they go into surgery with that particular surgeon or group of surgeons at all times. Um, Idaho does not have a requirement that you have to have your certified first surgical assist credential to function as a private scrub. Um, but again, we're kind of trying to change some of this. We're hoping to start a CSFA program in the next two years. And um, just so it becomes uh, more commonplace for the hospitals to see, yes, these people functioning in that role should have this credential. Um, so that'll, you'll see this change in the next few years. Um, some states do require for someone to function as a private scrub that they have to have their CSFA. Um, as I said, Idaho does not. So again, sales rep and then a traveler. Um, we, you'll see the winter in the hospitals that there are quite a few people who are travelers working there. We have travelers who are nurses and CSTs, and that's when um, the hospitals are short staffed, then they will hire travelers from, from an agency to come and work. Usually it's a 13 week contract um, and you, or you can extend it. Sometimes we've had travelers that are there for a year. Sometimes, you know, they're only there for the one 13 weeks. A lot of people think that this is going to be really fun. Um, but when you go to a hospital that needs travelers, it's usually because that unit is in trouble. They're short staffed. Um, they've had a lot of people um, leave. They've had a mass exodus of staff. And so they're scrambling to get those rooms up and running and they will hire travelers. So um, I do know some people have made a very successful career out of it. It's not something you want to do with a family because it would be really difficult to drag your family around for 13 weeks at a time, especially if you have kids in school and things like that. But I do know some single people that have done it for quite a long time and have loved it. They've gotten to go to places like Hawaii and Scrub and um, all over the country. So it just depends on your on your personal choices, I think, at that time. So training options for the surgical technologists, um, you know, there are, like I said, career technical certificate programs, which are going to be obsolete here in the next year, um, two year college degrees. And then there are also some some schools that are offering a four year bachelor's degree in surgical technology. And it's a little bit different than when I mentioned you can transfer to BSU and get your bachelor's of applied science. You can get that degree in surgical technology, but that's an option um, with your surgical technology AAS. Some colleges actually have the four-year bachelor's for surgical technology as an option for their students. So that's a little bit different. And then obviously the um, military programs we talked about too, that there are. Um, so I, I think I want to go back. It's like it's skipping something here. No, I guess that's it. Okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about other people that you're going to come across in the operating room. So obviously you're always going to have a surgeon in your room, and that's the person who has uh, is responsible for that patient, um, responsible for the procedure, all of those things. And you're going to find it used to be that everybody who was a surgeon was an MD. Um, now we have doctors of osteopathic medicine. And some of you may be familiar with ICOM that's out on the freeway over out by Renaissance High School and ISU. And that's our first medical school in Idaho. And it does not um, confer the MD degree. It confers the DO degree. Um, they haven't graduated their first cohort yet. I think they, I think this might 
they might have fourth year students this coming year. Is that correct? And so they will um, graduate their first ones. I actually have a friend, um, well, some neighbors of our in McCall, their daughter's going there right now, and she's first year. And I don't, and I asked her, I said, are you eligible to apply to all of the residency programs that ends are? She said, she doesn't even know that yet. So it seems like a lot of the um, DO schools, I think they're a little bit more limited as far as what they, what they can and can't do. But we have some anesthesiologists who are DOs. There's now a few surgeons in Boise and in Napa that are DOs. Um, and so you're going to start seeing that more and more often. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an MD. They're put through the same rigorous training as an MD. They just have a little bit different philosophy on how they treat their patients. They treat them more as supposedly as people is what you hear um, more holistically instead of um, just medically and scientifically. And then you might, you know, be working with a, a dentist, either a DDM or a DDS. Sometimes, usually they bring their own assistance. There are times when, you know, a patient is having dental surgery or an extraction or it's a child or um, someone mentally challenged and they need to put them under a general anesthetic. And so that's why they will come to the hospital instead. And you may be assigned to that room, but you may not do a lot because, like I said, they bring their own dental assistance with them. And then we also work um, at some hospitals, podiatrists have privileges to admit patients and do surgery. And so you may be, you know, working with a podiatrist who's not an MD or a DO, and they just work on um, things below the knee, basically, so ankle surgery and things like that. A lot, of, a lot more soft tissue, I think. They don't do quite as much bone, do yeah. they? Or, so it's more soft tissue on the feet. Um, so then you're going to have an anesthesiologist in the room, and that anesthesiologist, as I said, can be an MD or a DO. So if it's an anesthesiologist, that person has gone through medical school, again, whether it's an MD or a DO, and then they've done an anesthesia residency. So they're a doctor as well. An anesthetist is an RN with advanced anesthesia training. So most of the people that you will be working with in the room are anesthetists, or we call them CRNAs, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetists. And so the anesthesiologist can be uh, maybe in charge of six or seven rooms, and they kind of float in and out of the rooms. They respond if there's an emergency. A lot of times they're in the rooms during intubation when the patient is put to sleep and during extubation as the patient's coming out of their anesthesia. Um, but not always. So you're, you may not see the anesthesiologist in the rooms the entire time. What you're going to see are the CRNAs um, in the rooms. And now some of the CRNA programs, they earn their um, PhD instead of a master's degree, so they can be called doctor as well. <laughs> they like that. So then um, as assistants in the operating room, so these are not physicians, so don't get this confused because every year on the test people confuse this, but these are non-physician first assistants. So PAs, and I'm sure most of you by now know what a PA is, um, they go through, um, they, they have to have a bachelor's degree and then they earn a master's um, degree typically. I think there are a few bachelor's degree program still out there for PAs. And then they can work um, with physicians, um, with surgeons. They can admit patients, write prescriptions, discharge patients. Um, but they're under the supervision of a, of a physician or a surgeon, um, depending on who they're working for. So they could be the assistant in the room sometimes. It can be a PA. Um, you can have an RNFA, which is a registered nurse who has gone through a first assist training program that's very similar to the CSFA program for CSTs. Um, you don't see as many RNFAs um, as you do CSFAs or PAs. Um, they tend to, 
you know, if a doctor has a, a nurse that works in their office, they tend to want to keep them in the office and not bring them to surgery because they need them doing other things. So you really are not going to see a lot of RNs or RNFAs um, scrubbing in OR. And then again, it could be a certified surgical technologist who is assisting the surgeon. They've been hired by that surgeon as a private scrub or they're functioning as a, um, a first assist, they're a hospital employed, but they're functioning as a first assist um, on some of the cases. So, any questions about that? Okay. So then we have physicians who assist as well. So again, this is where I don't want you to get confused because when people see PAs, they think it's a physician assist. Well, PA is not a, a doctor, though. So these are actual doctors who are first assist. So this could be, again, an MD, a DO, a DMD, DDS, or a podiatrist. So you can have another physician functioning as an assistant in a case. Um, it could be a partner of the surgeon. It could be the physician that referred this patient and they want to get in there and, and assist this surgeon. Um, so like a family practice doc. Um, or it could be a retired surgeon who doesn't practice anymore. Maybe they've given up their practice, but other surgeons will call and say, hey, I need somebody to assist me on this case. Are you available? And you see that you know, quite often in orthopedic surgeries and, and some neurosurgeries you'll have someone who used to practice or be in that um, practice with that surgeon, but now they just assist. So, so is this all making sense? If I, I have a hard time gauging if you, how you guys are doing without seeing faces here. Yes. Just tell Jordan. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are they nodding, Jordan? Okay. Best I can tell, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about exactly what a surgical technologist does um, to kind of get a case going and um, what they're going to do throughout the day. So we're going to break this into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative duties of a CST. So you're going to make sure that the room's been properly cleaned. Um, sometimes it's going to be used. Sometimes you're going to go in the morning and it's already been terminally cleaned the night before. But the first thing you always want to do when you walk in a room, um, even though it, it's clean and everything, you want to damp dust everything. You want to go through and wipe down all of the horizontal surfaces. And so all of these tables that you see in the background, that's what I'm talking about. Anything where dust could have collected overnight, even though, even though it's clean, there's still possibility of dust, which can um, harbor microorganisms. So we do that first thing in the morning. Um, the OR bed that you see in the middle of this picture, um, right now it has sheets on it and everything. So you'd wipe that down first and then you would make the bed. Um, usually your circulator is gonna be in there with you too. And so you might start damp testing. They might start you know, making the bed, things like that. Everybody kind of just does, does what they know needs to be done. Um, prior to the case, and then kind of arrange the OR furniture. And this is something that Angel and Jordan will point out when you go through your tour on Monday too and show you, you know, what's a back table, what's a mayo stand, what's a ring stand, all of those things. Um, and then you'll have a case cart in there that has supplies and equipment on it. And you're going to open those sterile supplies with the circulator, um, sometimes the circulator you know, might need to run for some other things or find some other things. You may end up opening your room um, with another CST that's floating or, you know, usually you have some help when you're in there. Um, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're in there opening by yourself. Um, but not as a student. You're not going to open by yourself, only as, a, as an employee. Um, you might assist in the transportation of patients to the surgical suite, but usually that's something that the RN is going to be doing because you're going to be scrubbed in at that point. Um, so you're going to perform a surgical hand scrub, and then you start preparing the sterile field. And so at the bottom picture where you see the guy all dressed in blue, and he's that's his back table there that's already been opened up sterilely, and so now he's 
he is sterile enough where he can get up to that field and start touching everything without fear of contamination. And um, you know, then once he's all set up and ready to go, he's going to count sponges, needles, equipment with the circulator. A circulator should hopefully be back in the room at that time. And then um, the surgeon and the assistants will come in. You're going to gown and glove the surgeon and the assistants, and you're going to assist in draping the patient. You're going to attach suction tubing and electrosurgical cords to the patient. You know, and that would be the minimum that you would be attaching to the patient. A lot of times it's a lot more than that, especially if it's a laparoscopic or a robotic procedure. We have a lot of cords, light cords, and and different things that you would attach, which aren't going to make a lot of sense right now to you, but but they will soon. Um, and then intraoperatively, you are providing direct patient care, as I mentioned before, by passing the needed instruments, supplies, and equipment to the surgeon, and you're anticipating the surgeon's needs. So you're not just standing there waiting for them to ask for things. You're paying attention to the procedure. You're trying to trying to see what's going on and think, okay, this is what I think he's going to need, he or she is going to need next. And so I'm going to have that in my hand. I'm going to have that ready. Um, you're going to keep your sterile field orderly and clean, um, maintain aseptic technique, um, clean your instruments too. And this is something that uh, we try and stress, uh, we try and stress it in the lab, but it's a little bit hard because we don't have enough blood in here for you guys to clean your instruments. But um, we call this point of use care, where as soon as you get an instrument back, you kind of wipe it off quickly. And it doesn't mean you have to scrub it clean or anything, but you're kind of wiping off the blood because what happens is blood gets very sticky. And if you're handing a dirty instrument, like a pair of sharp scissors back to a surgeon and it's dried blood and it's very sticky, obviously that's not going to cut as well. So you want to keep those things clean. It also helps at the end of the case with decontaminating the instruments before they go down um, to the sterile processing and decontam area. Um, you're going to retract tissue, you're going to cut sutures, and then again you're going to be counting sponges, needles, and instruments with the circulator on the way out when they start to close the patient. Um, you're going to identify and care for specimens. Um, during the case and prepare and pass medications to surgeons. So those are just kind of in a nutshell what we do during the case. And again, a lot of this will make sense once you're able to, to see this. Hopefully we'll have some good surgeries for you guys to see on, on um, Monday night, maybe even a trauma or two. And then postoperatively, and so when we talk about the postoperative phase, that means that this, the patient, you know, we're done closing the patient. Um, drapes have come off the patient at that time. You're going to assist um, by getting the dressings ready, and then you're going to help wash blood and other body fluids off the patient. Usually it's you and the circulator up at the field doing that at that time. Um, and then the, surgeon, the circulator will tape the dressing after you put that on. And then, then you kind of need to pay attention to what else the patient needs, not worry about your equipment and everything at that time. Just if they need help moving the patient over to the gurney, then you're going to be doing that. And then after the patient's out of the room, you kind of start to clean up everything else. You're disposing sharps, getting your instruments ready to go down to decontam the, um, where they're going to be processed again. Okay, um, and I do like to talk about things that we can't do. And something to keep in mind too is that we are certified, we are not licensed, and certification is a voluntary process, although this gets confusing because it's really not voluntary in, in Idaho and most states it's not voluntary. Um, licensure is not voluntary, but um, because we're not licensed, we, there are certain things that we can't do um, unless you are functioning under the direct supervision of a surgeon who has hired you. So we are not the ones that are administering medications. We are not um, injecting local either before or after a procedure. We're not administering anesthetic agents. Um, we need to have proper supervision when we are with the patients. And what I mean, um, if you are 
at the field, you're being supervised by the surgeon. Um, so you need to understand that you don't do anything without their direction, but then there's also things that they might ask you to do. Even if they're asking you to do, you should never do. So you should never be the one that clamps tissue, um, places sutures or alter body tissues without proper privileges. And the reason I say proper privileges is if you are hired as a private scrub, and that means that a surgeon is paying you to be there with them, but you also have then had to go through the credentialing committee at the hospital, then you work under his super, supervision. So if he wants you to suture and he has taught you to suture, then you're able to do that. So that's where the without proper privileges comes in. As a hospital CST, most places you're never going to suture, but I, I say most places because there are exceptions to that, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we get, you know, into mock surgeries and things like that. Um, altering body tissues would mean you should never be the one that if a surgeon's holding something up and he says, hey, can you, you know, cut that for me? You never do that. You just say, I'm not allowed to do that. So we've had a couple times where students feel really good about the fact that a surgeon is asking them to do something and they know it's without, not within their scope. And if it ever goes to court, um, if you say, well, the surgeon asked me to, the surgeon's probably gonna say, no, I didn't, because they're gonna save their ass, they're not gonna worry too much about you. So just always keep that in mind. And we'll talk about that more during the legal unit too. Um, we don't administer blood, um, that's anesthesia's role in the operating room. And then we never have the final sign off on OR documentation. The circulator is the one that's preparing the final OR documentation. Um, so they are the ones that sign their name. When I worked years ago at St. Al's, we always had to sign the OR docs at the end of the case just to say that, yes, we agreed with the count, and now they, they don't even do that. You're still responsible for the count, but you're not signing off on it, which um, is a little, I don't know. To me, it seems like if you're responsible for the count and making sure it's correct, that you should also be signing it too. But that's the way they do things now. Okay, so that's um, kind of it in a nutshell for all of this. I know you, you guys learned an enormous amount today, I think, with all of this. So where do I get back on? Is it here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. How do we see their faces? Right here. Okay. Okay, so before we let you guys go, are there any questions or anything that we can answer for you? No? No. Jordan, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> yeah, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> that's, that's in the well, next, you see. Um, next lecture. And I don't want to give that away. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I will be posting the Prezi presentation. I'll also be posting the link for the video that we saw today. Again, if you guys have any questions, concerns, um, you know, if you're confused about the different roles in the OR, please send me an email and I'll be more than happy to, to communicate with you to, for you to understand. Uh, exam opens Friday morning at 12.01 and closes Monday night at 11.59 p.m. Please, please, please do not wait until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock Sunday night to start the exam. Uh, that's just asking for your internet to go down, for Blackboard to be down, etc. So please try you know, to just at least start your exam by five or six Sunday night. And if you have issues with the exam, please text me and and I will get on and, and try to help resolve those issues. All right, any other questions or concerns? All right, well, thanks okay. for being here. Thanks, you guys. And um, I probably won't be on any of the other ones that Angel or, or Jordan are gonna present um, unless they want me to at some point, but 
Um, they're very, very capable. Um, <laughs> but please, if you have any questions about certain things that I can answer for you to administrative type things, um, I, I um, am always on my email, so feel free to email me and I'll try and answer those questions as best that I can. Um, again, remember that we do have a mandatory orientation right before the start of the fall semester, Thursday the 19th, and just plan on four o'clock. Um, I just kind of sent out an email to the other instructors to make sure that time works for them, and I'm sure, I'm sure it will, but just plan on four o'clock. It'll probably take a few hours, but there's a lot of things that um, we want to cover prior to starting the fall classes so that we can just hit the ground running and you guys are going to have um, so much more time in the lab and the hospitals than we've been able to do before because of getting these summer classes, these two classes out of the way. We used to teach these in the fall too. So, so we're going to have a lot more hands-on time in the fall, but we need to get through some of the other orientation stuff prior to that. So. And, and sorry, just for the quick, you said that was a Thursday before we start fall, right? So the Correct. 19th. it's the 19th, yeah. Okay. Just making and sure. And it will be in, in our lab. It will not be virtual. It will okay. be here in the lab face to face. <laughs> Whoa. First. Whoa. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure and I'm not see, ready for that. Not just I know. I'm not sure I am either. I just, <laughs> just got rid of those other people. Um, <laughs> no. Um, and just so you guys know, if you are um, immunized with the COVID vaccine, um, you will not have to wear masks in the classroom, but we understand that there are certain people that may not be and choose not to be, um, and you will be required then to wear masks in the classroom at all times. So last year, everybody did um, regardless, um, and then this year CWI has loosened, loosened its policy as long as you um, have had the vaccine you don't need to wear your mask in, in the classroom. So unless I hear any differently, um, that's that's the way it'll be. So keep that in mind for the orientation. If you are um, not vaccinated, just make sure you have a mask. Or actually, we have them here too. <laughs> Yay. Go figure, we're a surgical lab, so mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all right, thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. I just hit cancel. Thank you.